Okay. Okay. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming and welcome you in summer school on post mining landscape restoration, which is organized with help of a tracer project. And I would like welcome here Rainer Janssen, who is a principal investigator of Tracer Project, and he will tell us a few introductory words. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, to, uh, Jan, for this uh, kind introduction. Um, dear colleagues, um, I would like uh, to issue, um, on behalf of all partners of the Tracer Project, a warm welcome to all of the participants um, of the uh, Tracer uh, Summer School. Uh, it is the, the third summer school restoration of post-mining landscapes as uh, Jan has uh, already introduced. Um, I would like to start also with the many thanks to Professor Jan Fuss and his uh, team from the Environmental Center of Charles University in Prague for organizing this uh, summer school and, and for putting together an excellent program. Uh, many thanks also to uh, all lecturers that will contribute to interesting uh, days between today, starting now, uh, until uh, Friday afternoon, you will have uh, two sessions uh, every day, um, morning and evening, uh, depending where you are, uh, depending on the time zone. Uh, a few words on the Tracer project. Uh, the full name of Tracer is uh, Smart Strategies for the Transition in Coal Intensive uh, Regions. Uh, the Tracer project is co-funded by the European Commission within the program Horizon 2020. The main aim of the Tracer project is the development of research and innovation strategies to support the transition towards a more sustainable energy uh, system in a number of coal intensive regions across Europe. Actually, we within the Tracer project, uh, we have uh, participants uh, uh, from nine coal int intensive regions all over uh, Europe. And actually one of the, the, the main aspects of the Tracer is knowledge exchange and learning from, uh, from each other. So actually we have uh, uh, regions from Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Germany, Greece, Poland, Romania, Serbia, Ukraine, and the United Kingdom, Wales in this case. Um, what, what we do within the way, uh, Tracer project is actually one of the main aims is to mobilize a wide range of stakeholders and involve all kinds of stakeholders, uh, let's say small organizations, large organizations, and involve them in the development of these research and innovation strategies. Um, we have produced in the first half of the Tracer project a number of uh, very good reports uh, assessing all kinds of aspects in these um, and nine oh, so all these are available on the trace of Please uh, have a look. Um, we are also looking in the tracer project as at best practices, for instance, all be also best practices in the field of restoration that will be topic of this uh, summer school. Uh, in tracer, we also look at financing options for um, uh, for projects. Um, and also on capacity building and educational aspects to move forward within the, the transition in coal intensive regions. It is a hot topic, as we all know from the, from the news. Uh, so there is a lot to do. There is also a lot to learn. Um, so with that, uh, I would pass back to, uh, to Jan, I think, for his first lecture. And uh, thanks again, basically, for your interest um, and uh, enjoy uh, this summer school. I mean, and uh, sorry, I would like to acknowledge my uh, colleague Rita Mergner, who is actually uh, coordinating the Tracer project uh, together with me at WIP Renewable Energies in based in Munich. Uh, thank you very much, Jan. Okay, thank you, Rainer, for a very kind introduction. And uh, as you see from the program, today we will have two uh, sessions. The first one will be held by me, the second one by uh, uh, there will be lunch break, and then will be uh, the colleague Masto uh, from Reginald Masto from India, and he will give you some best examples from India. While my speech will be really very introductory, and will be a definition of terms and what we expect 
the mining restoration. So I would like Agata if uh, she can unshare his screen and I can actually share my my uh, I can share my uh, I can share my screen here. So I'm sorry I get stuck here a little bit. For some reason, start to save my file right now. Okay, I think we are good to go. So can you see uh, my presentation and can you see it in full screen mode or not yet? Not, not yet. Just okay, so I, I have to double click on the I don't know, I, because I, uh, I have to, I have to change. Uh, I'm, I have actually, I have actually another. Uh, so once more. Um, share and then should change it. Hmm. Because you have view like I, I have it, and as I don't want this, so shut. Máš to na dvou obrazovkách náhodou? Mám to na dvou obrazovkách. Tak zkus, jestli zkus, tak zkus vypnout tu jednu obrazovku. No jo, ale jak to udělám? Tady je takové to změna toho režimu, že ukazuju e, prezentace. Nebo mi to zkus poslat ještě. To je veliký. Hmm. E, A když dáš F5, tak to nic neudělá? Můžu zkusit. Já už teď totiž mám ten prezentační mod, víš. Jo. Ale akorát, že ho vidím tady na té druhé obrazovce a ne, a ne jakoby... Jo. Um, ono se ještě pak dá nastavit. Um, to někde nastavoval. V tom zoomu, že to dáš z té druhé no. obrazovky, ale já... Se přiznám. Já zkusím teda rychle zavolat Jirkovi. Zkus zavolat, prosím tě, Jirkovi. Sorry, I am just, uh, because I'm basically showing you the view I should have instead of screen view. So... Hanzo, a nedá se ti F5, když uděláš? Já to ukazuju na druhý obrazovce. Potřebuji přehodit. Uh, tak uh, prosím tě, ukonči zde, uh, nech to tak, ukonči sdílení. A pust to znova share screen a najdi si ten plnej, to plný zobrazení. Počkej, teď tě nerozumím. Teďka ukončíš sdílení. Ukončí sdílení, stop share, no. ano. Tak, a teďka dej si share screen. Ano. A tam uvidíš jeden čtvereček, že je ten plný obraz. Ne. To tě nerozumím. Znovu dám share screen. Ne, tam, má, tam si měl, v tom, když si dal to share screen, tak jsi tam měl na výběr víc věcí. Oh. A jedno je taky to zobrazení, ne ten, to druhé no, zobrazení toho PowerPointu. To není, je, mám, tady jenom ty, mám tady jenom ty faily, vidím jenom jedno. A ty ho nemáš puštěný. Teď ne. Tak ho pust napřed. Uh. Teď F5 ho pusť. 
Teď mi to ukazuje, prostě ono mi to ukazuje na té druhé obrazovce, víš? No, ten... no te, takhle ho pust na té druhé obrazovce a teď jde share screen a teď tam v té nabídce uvidíš i tu plnou obrazovku. Tu prezentaci. Nevidím. V tom share screen v nabídce uvidíš i tu, i tu nabídku toho PowerPoint hmm. a prezentace PowerPoint. No, bohužel ne. Nevidím. E, a ty máš dvě obrazovky, jako? No, mám dvě obrazovky. No, tak ještě to teda, prosím tě, tak ještě jinak, nazdílej tu prezentaci teda. Ano. Tak, a teďka tam v tom prezentaci dáš, ale ty, to vypadá, když nemáš ten druhý monitor. Mám ho, no. To monitor, ho vidím. když si dáš... Tak doprava, vlastně... doprava, úplně. Ješ, doprava, ještě doprava. Tak Tady, tam si nemůžeš jsem... vybrat monitor. Použít zobrazení prezentujícího. No. Teď by to, to, mělo to, ne, tak... to není dobře, ale nad tím ten monitor. Tak si na tu dobu vypni ten druhý monitor prostě a půjde ti to. Tak. No, nejde, nejde to. Já pož... no, a teďka to pust normálně F5. F5. Kontrol F5 nebo F5? F5. Hmm. Asi musíš ukončit tu prezentaci, asi ji máš teďka, tak ji ukončit a znova. Tak. Tak. Ale já tady to... Teď normálně tu prezentaci nemáš jako prezentaci, ne? Nebo... No, nemám. Nemáš, tak teďka to nazdílej. Nazdílejím. Teď vidím tu screen, tu prázdnou. Počkej. Já si vyberu. A teď, když dáš F5? Pracovatel. Tak jak to vidíte teď? No, tak ještě prosím ti to ukončí teďka. Ne, teď to vidíme dobře. Ne, nebo? Nevidíme, ještě to ukončí. Hmm. U prezentaci jenom. Teď se tam nedostane. Escapem. No. Tak a teďka tam odškrtni to použít, tohle odškrtni a znova. No. Teď. Ještě chvilku, vidíš F5. Tak jsem dal tu prezentaci dole, jako dal jsem F5. Já zkusím dát F5, teda, dobrý. To je jako kdyby se ti zobrazoval furt na tom druhém monitoru, jako kdyby byl zapnutý. Teď jsem ho zapnul, no, tak já vypnu. No. Tak ještě to ukončí escapem tu prezentaci. Ukončil si ji. Dal jsem escape. No. Uh. Hele, já bych to nechal v tom módu, jak to bylo prostě. Dobře, dobře. Uh. No, to ještě ne, 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 tohle ne, to nedávej. A nad tím, nad tím, to nad tím ten monitor, dej primární monitor Ani teďka. To... A teď to pusť. Tak. No, skvělý, skvělý. OK, I'm sorry for technical difficulties we have in the start, but I'm going to welcome you in the first uh, lecture about restoration and we will speak about restoration ecology and reclamation in particular connection to post mining sites can you hear me uh, can you hear me well yes okay. yes yes all fine yes so yes what is what is reclamation you see as usually two terms are used uh, like reclamation and restoration And there is basically a kind of distinction between them. So when we want to reclaim that, there is a German word also recultivation. We want to actually achieve some target. We want to produce land of certain use for humans, certain kind of sustainability, certain kind of suitability for production and so on. When we are speaking about restoration, We usually want to restore some original ecosystem <clears throat> or at least some system close to that. Certainly, 
The question actually arises: what is the original ecosystem? Because throughout the development, uh, on that same very same time, there was different kind of ecosystem. And sometimes we can choose to which one we are going to return. So I will be speaking in reclamation in terms of restoring of, let's say, the habitat, the altar for human purposes, so cultural landscape, if you want, and restoration in terms of restoring of natural habitat or close to natural habitat. I'm giving you example of post mining reclamation targets in two different states of United States. Curio you know, what is, what is actually interesting that these two targets follow the same federal law, but as you see, they are different. So in Illinois, the target is actually to reclaim post mining land to, re to reach equal or higher agriculture production as the former pre-mining land. This definition is actually driven by fact that in Illinois, most of the mined land is former agricultural land. On the other hand, in Wyoming, the restoration targets peak, the target is to restore a short gas prairie ecosystem that should serve as a pasture for game or livestock. And the target include list of typical indicator prairie species. So here we are more close to this uh, restoration. So we want to, we are speaking about ecosystem. So we want to restore something which will be some functioning, which will have certain structural characteristic. And there is also some mentioning about production should be used as a pasture, but this um, use actually is much less suppressed. So we might have different view what our target is and what we want to emphasize. This is something we should keep in mind. If we have some ecosystem which was degraded, uh, then we might go to, let's say, uh, recultivation. And by recultivation, we get ecosystem who is structurally less diverse, but they have usually higher production then some natural ecosystem, which we can reach by successional processes or restoration. And this is usually less productive, but more structurally diverse, more sustainable and so on. Very often we have, um, uh, very often we have also situation when we have natural ecosystem and we change it to this cultural ecosystem. Sometimes this is also called recultivation to make terminology even more difficult. However, we should be aware that if we left this ecosystem by its own, there is some natural processes which are going to move this ecosystem to some natural state. We call that succession and basically, if we have some abundant land, the organisms are going to migrate there, establish, they will compete, then they will change environment, produce soil, and eventually these changes will be slower and slower. So at the end, they will be almost negligible. The ecosystem will kind of produce uh, the same species which are there at the moment. Over time, the species are going to lose some important nutrients. They will be less productive and we call that retrogression. So basically, that actually show us that natural ecosystem needs some kind of disturbance. Actually, we use arable land. Arable land is disturbed by us every year. The reason why Northern Hemisphere is actually because we have, uh, you know, ice ages, which disturbs our soil and allow our soil to start again and again, and that way hold nutrients. But in many cases, we might not rely on succession. I'm going to show you one cases like that, and this is bauxite mining in Australia. 
And the reason why we cannot rely on succession in this particular case is that this Jera forest, which is mined here, is really a retrogression ecosystem, which means not only there is low phosphorus and so on, but it also means there is a lack of species which have ability to colonize newly disturbed habitat. The species there are adapted on fire, but they usually survive fire on place. They are able to germinate after fire and so on. But if we leave this post mining sites in Jera forest by its own, for next 20 years, nothing much will happen. So that's why we start to have some restoration, some reclamation effort. And also in here, there is a target what the mining company should achieve. And in that actually question, the target is to uh, achieve a presence of all species which had more than 1% of general cover. We might discuss if this is actually a soft target or hard target. It's a, one of the hardest target I have ever seen in the post mining uh, permission uh, environment. On the other hand, if you speak about what is the proportion from species, there is actually more, less than half species, yeah? because if you look on the species list, only a few species have high abundance, high cover, and actually most of the species list is formed by a very rare species, which occur in the lower than 1% cover. So in terms of species list, it doesn't mean we get almost all species list, we get like one third. But in terms of ecosystem functioning, we get more or all more important species. So how this is done? Basically, there is a, a modification of landscape. So they push uh, in the hole all the boulders, then they fill it by subsoil and then they spread topsoil. And because these processes increase compaction, they actually deep cultivate it and at the same time they drill the seeds and they fertilize by phosphorus because they know that the mining operation reduce phosphorus amount and the phosphorus is limiting element in that particular environment. As concerned the seed, you know, the seed mixture is actually assembled for each site, depend on vegetation survey, which was there before mining. And the seeded species are those which establish well from seeds and which cannot be brought by topsoil. So they know list of species they have before, they know target species which have more than 1%, from them, they check off the species which will be brought by topsoil, and then they seed those species which can be brought by seeds and they are available. And this is how it's actually look like one year after this operation. And they also know that some species spread only vegetatively. It cannot be brought by seeds or topsoil, so they can be planted. So this, these are planted actually, and you see they are planted in some plastic wrap to protect them against herbivory, against kangaroo who can eat it. This is actually a facility to produce these seeds. And this is how the ecosystem looks like 20 years after uh, planting. So this is example of restoration of post mining sites, which target to restore close to natural Jara forest ecosystem. So there is a reference community, which is Jara forest. There is established a target. There is developed method. And certainly there is a performance application of that method. And there is constant monitoring uh, to see how the ecosystem is developing. You might actually see that the trees are dark here, which means they're after fire because fire is actually typical uh, part of this uh, ecosystem. So when we speak about uh, restoration ecology as a discipline, this actually have many aspects of ecology, 
many technical aspects and uh, it's also deal with community. And when we we'll be speaking about the recultivation, which is here under technical aspect, this also have to use a lot of ecological knowledge here. It also depends on community. So there is both of this discipline have this overlap between ecological knowledge, technological application and community perception. Uh, why we want to restore the ecosystem? You know, it might sound like a silly question looking on mining sites, but let's, let's just ask this question as I chance to answer it, because it will actually show us what should drive our decision when we do that. So certainly uh, we want to restore ecosystem services and there might be broad range of ecosystem services as we've been speaking about. We have also moral obligation to do so because we make some damage. And certainly uh, restoring ecosystem can bring us, uh, can allow us to do a very good test of our knowledge. So how much our knowledge is applicable to solve a real problem. We use the word ecosystem services and ecosystem services is actually approach that try to evaluate in money the value the nature provide to us. Constanza and colleagues ask in the 90s, what actually is a value of world ecosystem? Imagine you know, the aliens from outer space came and want to buy our ecosystem. So how much we want to ask for that? So how much the annual is the annual revenue we are getting from the natural ecosystem? And this is called ecosystem services. And Constanza actually assume it's about 33 trillion of US dollars, which is quite a lot, considering the fact that in time the Constanza was gathering the data, the world GDP was about 18 trillion. So basically the, the nature globally provide for us very important services in monetary value. And these services are very variable. It's a some provisioning services like providing food, fiber, and so on. It's a regulation, so regulation of climate and so on. And it's a cultural services. The supporting services are no, not really including among the services, but they're essential for services to work. So basically on these two picture, you can see Manhattan. The picture below actually shows Manhattan before a white man came and a picture above shows Manhattan as we see it today. And there's not really, uh, you know, do not need too much imagination to imagine that ability of the Manhattan to store water, for example, to provide uh, plant production was much larger in historical time than today. So we actually increase some use of in Manhattan as a human, you know, as a place for human living, but we decrease many other ecosystem services the island has provided. And the same can be seen, you know, this is a Florida in 1900 and end of past century and actually make a black natural ecosystem and white ecosystem we transformed. And again, you see we are losing this natural ecosystem. And sometimes we even do that in a way which is not necessary. Like, you know, we have a grassland and this grassland we actually uh, treat as a very productive ecosystem. We supply huge amount of nitrogen, huge amount of water to support, you know, uh, growth of grass, which we can mow and put to garbage. So, and this is, you know, again, how this is related to mining sites. Uh, we should think because very often the reclamation is trying to increase productivity of ecosystem on any cost, basically. And we should think about if we really need that, you know, if the production is really what we need from ecosystem. 
And uh, this, this, this backyard is actually a nice example of that because we do whatever possible to increase production of this backyard. In many costs, not only the money we pay for fertilizer and mowing and watering, but also associated ecological damage, which is associated from nitrate leaching and water scarcity and so on. Compared to picture on the left, which show natural vegetation somewhere in Arizona, which people used on the lawn, on the backyard to fulfill the aesthetic function, you know, to have a nice view from the window. So basically, uh, this is the aspect I would like to, to highlight. When we decide to modify ecosystem certain way, we should really be sure, sure why we want to do this. Certainly, the ecosystem is a very complex thing. And if we can, if we are able to restore it, we, we really know, we understand it. So this is this knowledge stuff uh, incentive. Uh, you know, the ecosystem can be degraded in different steps. Sometimes you have ecosystem which is perfectly functioning by its own. And if we don't do anything, the ecosystem will be there for millennia. But sometimes this ecosystem can get degraded by, I don't know, uh, some uh, extensive grazing, for example, extensive erosion, or you know, mining cause even bigger uh, degradation. Uh, what is important to realize when we think about nature, we usually think that the changes in nature are more or less gradual, but this is not completely true, you know, systems in nature are in certain balanced stage. And when we push them out of the state, it's like a switch. Then they just flip to another stage. And this uh, actually points, we call them flipping points. When this ecosystem turns from one stage to another, this is actually something we need to explore and we need to understand in our reclamation or restoration work. So we can imagine ecosystem on this green ball. And basically, you know, uh, natural ecosystem was somewhere here. And then we might create, you know, highly productive ecosystem, which would be kind of artificial and would be somewhere here. And we can maintain it. But when we degrade ecosystem even more, you know, it's came to another stage and will be stay here and it might not change, you know, to natural ecosystem, it might take a long time. Typical example of this arrested succession, which needs some push from people, is this example from Gulf War. You know, during the Gulf War, uh, in, Go in, in, in the Gulf of Persia, there was a huge leakage of petrol, huge leakage of, of uh, gas and they actually affected local mangrove in terms they kill you know a lot of biota there among other they eliminate a crayfish and the crayfish are important bioturbator of the mud and the mud start to be covered by algae and the algae mud was so thick that it was really difficult for incoming crayfish to, to colonize but it actually takes just a little effort from human side, a little bit of raking, and we disturb that mud of algae. And then we create a habitat when the incoming crayfish can start to build the uh, holes and start to perturbation of the, of, the, of the mud. And all ecosystem basically came back to, back to normal. So there was just a little push you know, needed to, to push the ball backwards and, and uh, the nature will do it by its own. So that's basically what we are trying to do in restoration work and in reclamation work. We actually need to know where we want to ecosystem have. And then we'll be looking how we need to push as little as possible to make our ecosystem there. And I was speaking quite a lot about diversity and about productivity. 
So basically, when we are looking on the disturbed ecosystem, disturbed ecosystem is certainly less diverse and less productive than uh, you know, mature one. But actually, the highest productivity and highest diversity do not occur in the later stages of succession when we have a forest, but they occur in intermediate stages of succession, somewhere in the middle. You see, uh, that might be the reason why many mining sites offer excellent opportunity for restoring a nature close uh, habitat. This is a species number in mining forefield of post mine and, uh, and in post mining heaps in circle of region in the Czech Republic. And you can actually see that amount of species in post mining land was reduced by about uh, 10 to 20%, but a post mining land harbor uh, many unique species which are rare or protected, they have nature conservation value, which are completely absent in surrounding landscape. So basically, uh, this show us there is a large potential of mining sites for uh, restoring nature, and there will be a Thursday evening afternoon lecture about that. The reason for that is that this heap post mining land contain a lot of this intermediate stages of succession. But there is also reason, as we will show later, that there is a lack of nutrients. The site is oligotrophic. This is actually in contrary to the surrounding landscape. And that's why it may promote diversity. Just to put a little bit of perspective, I was saying that. Sometimes this natural habitat, instead of being degraded like by mining and then restored, which was the, what, we, what we just see, they can be converted to more productive uh, land to be used for production purposes. And this is an example of peaty meadows we dry to increase you know, the hay production and the productivity. And you know, uh, one wouldn't assume this as a very catastrophic event. There's a still meadow, you know, still grass is green, everything is fine. But if you look on the species reduction, so this is different taxa, and this is total all taxa we studied. And basically all cases we see that reduction of species diversity by this meadow drainage is about 50%. So it's actually far more than mining. So this is something I'm showing here to a little bit maybe change your perception of mining. And certainly the mining is large disturbance and it needs to be restored, but it's also land which brings unique opportunities which are not available in surrounding landscape. I was already mentioned that part of this uh, uh, benefit is because the mining lack of nutrients. So basically, if we are looking how the species are changing, species diversity again, is changing against productivity of the gradient. So basically amount of nutrients available for plant grow, uh, we might actually see that at the beginning, that if there is no nutrients, there's very little diversity because not so many plants can really grow in places when there is no nutrients. However, once the nutrients increase, diversity increase. At certain point, and at certain point, these relationships break down and once we increase productivity, diversity goes down. Why is that? The reason is that until that point, the nutrients were limiting for plant growth. And the plant need to share limiting nutrients. 
and the nutrients actually occur in soil. They are 3D environment. There is different form of nutrients plant can use. So there is very difficult to monopolize the nutrients or by other words, it's very easy to share the nutrients. But from this point here, the light start to be limiting. And once the light start to be limiting, there is just a very few possibilities how to compete for light. So you can be taller, you can have bigger leaves, and you can basically outcompete your neighbors. We also speak about difference between productive ecosystem, which is usually more regular, more predictable, and natural ecosystem, which is more unpredictable, more stochastic, and but usually more stable. But this also might affect, you know, the human perception, because many people might actually like a cultural environment more. And this is important because this affects funding. Okay, so I'm just saying that uh, sometimes when we restore ecosystem, we even take, you know, this cultural landscape, I want to restore it to natural habitat. Yeah, so we want to move from this nitrogen rich to nitrogen poor environment. I'm just showing you examples of life project in Netherlands, which is trying to restore this arable land on the picture in the left to Heesland, us on the picture on the right, using very dramatic approaches that include topsoil removal and you know import of hay and uh, salt from uh, surrounding Heesland. I'm just showing you this just to show that in other places, people are spent tremendous amount of money. This project cost 18 million euros to reduce amount of nutrients in ecosystem. So this is something we should again, uh, you know, consider in our thinking before we start to push our mining sites in certain direction if it's actually we are not losing certain advantages that uh, would be there, and if we cannot achieve that easier. I already say, you know, if we leave that, many sites will follow uh, succession. This is example of pavement, which was abundant for about 15 years in South Africa. And you can see it's taking over by grass. And this succession actually allow natural recovery of vegetation. The succession usually starts by some kind of disturbance. However, we often uh, have a processes which we rather call degradation rather than disturbance. And, you know, many disturbances are natural, but many processes can start a long-term process of degradation. So you basically get the ecosystem on that tip when it's slippering to less sustainable system and cannot help itself to fix. Example here is overgrazing. Once we overgraze, we actually remove vegetation, we start erosion, then there is even less vegetation, grazing, grazing become even more intensive, which supports more erosion and so on. On the other hand, many systems are adapted to many natural uh, disturbances and they can live with that. And, you know, uh, this is example of Florida ecosystem and many of them actually depends on certain frequency of fire, which are that they cannot exist. Uh, certainly, uh, post mining sites are very artificial system, but many processes that apply in natural succession apply here as well. So after this disturbance, the species have to migrate 
And certainly some species migrate easily than the others. Also connectivity of your terrain affect migration. So if your natural ecosystem starts just at the edge of mining sites, migration would be much easier than if you make, you know, several hundred meters of nobody land, which you would actually use for bulldozers and heavy trucks and so on. Once the species establish, they start to grow, but this establishment is not automatic. We can improve conditions for plant to establish, or if the plant establish by its own, they usually look for some safe spaces which help them to establish. So you can see here spontaneously establishing woody vegetation on our picture. And you can see a chagrin of vegetation, which actually have these rows. And this is because this vegetation, this sur surface, have character of these waves. And you can see from this uh, diagram here, that certain parts of the waves, in this case, on northern slopes, are actually providing better habitat for tree establishment than the other uh, microsites. So basically, there is more this safe spaces for seeds to establish. Uh, certainly, once the plant establish, they change the environment and they actually can allow another species to establish. So this is an example of succession in post mining sites in Sokolov again. This is like 10, 20, 40 years old site. And you see in about this stage, the earthworm are start to colonize the sites. And we actually try to introduce uh, earthworms in these sites in large enclosures and we actually found in these younger sites, they are surviving, but they are struggling. They're losing the weight. They are slowly, gradually dying out. While in this 25 years old site, they are just surviving. And this is you know, growing, they are reproducing, they are doing well. So basically, uh, important moment is that this initial plant community uh, establish a soil development and the soil development allow earthworm to establish and earthworm then can help to change the soil and uh, eventually they help in establishing of more demanding uh, species. Because the earthworm actually support, you know, uh, formation of soil aggregates. These soil aggregates have higher water holding capacity, better infiltration, so they have better ability to support plant or more diverse plant community. So basically, if we look on the development of plant community, we actually see that. There are two clusters of plant community. The one is called Ruder cluster from pioneer species. The second consists from more demanding species. And actually what distinguish these two clusters is presence of humus layer, a pristine humus layer formed by earthworm cast. So basically colonization sites by earthworm. And so we can we can, in this particular case, we can wrap up the story in a way that this pioneer plant species came here, they modify soil a little bit, they allow earthworm to in there, to modify soil even more, and that will allow more demanding species to colonize the site. And basically, in our reclamation work, we try to push a system in the right direction so it can be rolling in direction we want. Certainly, I already mentioned that uh, I was speaking about plant succession so far. The animals are mostly depending on the matrix, on environment the plant are creating. 
But what is important or what is interesting in this particular figure, this is actually occurrence of different animals, different uh, game animals in uh, different uh, successional stages in post-fire succession in uh, North America. And you can see that there's actually more species that colonize this intermediate stages of succession than this late stages of succession. So again, uh, we should think, you know, how far, where we want to, we want to push it. I was speaking about succession. I was speaking about diversity, but how is ability of succession really to cover the land by vegetation cover, which provides many of the functions we already speak about, not only production, but also, you know, a protection against erosion and many other items. We actually look at it and we summarize about 200 successional series around the world from different situation, including mining sites, post-fire succession, you know, abundant fields, uh, lava flows, and many others, glacier retreat. And for each of the kernel sequence, we actually choose the points from the sum start of succession until the vegetation cover reach 50%. In that time, the increasing cover, as you see, is more or less linear. And for each of this succession series, we calculate this number, which is actually initial slope of succession development, and it actually tell us how quickly the vegetation cover get restored, or by other words, how many percentage of vegetation cover increase each year. And this table summarizes the results. And if we look on the vegetation cover total, we actually see that the secondary succession when you know, we have abandoned field and this field grow back is a much faster recovery. And in average, a 50% of cover is reached in uh, one and a half year. For primary succession, it will be close to seven years. And in particular for mining sites, it's in average about five years. This compared to, let's say, uh, abundant fields is much slower because abundant fields recover in the same extent in about one and a half year or less. This was total vegetation. However, if we look on the woody vegetation, we get quite different picture. Firstly, there is really no significant difference in speed of recovery and a medium uh, you know, mean time needed to reach 50% of woody cover will be about 12 years in both cases. And there is tremendous differences between individual succession types or kernel sequences. So for example, in abandoned land, it might take 17 years and in post-fire sites, it can take like six years. So actually a post-fire site can be an average much faster in woody vegetation recovery unassisted yeah, doing just by succession than uh, the Arab land, abundant Arab land. This actually shows us that the mining sites generally might have larger ability to support forest than Arab land. So if we are in the area when forests naturally occur, we should consider as much as possible to use mining sites as uh, for forest. We were thinking about what's the difference between these kind of sequences and we speculate, and emphasis speculate, that this can be basically done by two gradient and that's the nutrient availability, which is certainly higher in Arab land and soil compaction. The soil compaction is also have high on arable land. And if 
The mining sites are not treated any grading, any topsoil application. They might have quite low compaction. And we believe that's actually my support for this development. Just to illustrate that on some examples of mining sites. So this is uh, mining sites in Tennessee and you see reclaimed sites and non-reclaimed sites. And surprisingly, the non-reclaimed sites is doing better. And the same is there for 30 years and the same we can actually show uh, in a nematodes, the soil nematodes doing much better in this non-reclaimed sites than in the reclaimed one. The reason was that the reclamation in this particular situation caused tremendous soil compaction. And the soil compaction is really a large barrier for tree to establish. While if you don't have this barrier, you can actually reach forest quite comparable to a uh, cultural forest, to planted forest in few decades. So this is about 70 years old site in uh, Illinois. And you can see uh, they're very similar, but the right side is a planted vault or mining site. The left side actually developed by succession. I already mentioned the soil compaction may be a big problem. And the soil compaction is actually, uh, the, the, the top soil application, as we will speak about, is actually associated with soil compaction. But if you are going to restore a grassland, then this increasing in nutrients, this increasing in soil quality actually count more than compaction. And so in the biome, when we have a grassland, this is actually more promising technology. So this is uh, unreclaimed down here and reclaimed uh, uh, here uh, site in Wyoming where there's natural short grass prairie. The target ecosystem here is short grass prairie. And actually you see if you do nothing you have no much progress over 40 years. But if you bring topsoil, you seed target plants, which are grasses and some shrubs or herbs, you actually get very good results. So this is just some soil fungi. And you see this is orange is non-reclaimed sites here. Uh, yeah, these are non-reclaimed sites and the blue and green. Green are actually control natural sites and the green are actually restored sites. And you see they are very similar. So when you are in dry environment, uh, the, the topsoil application is actually the best things you can do. And you can achieve very fast ecosystem recovery that way. Okay, so let's focus now more closely on post-mining restoration after this general introduction. And this post-mining restoration, you see mining is a major disturbance and depends on the kind of mining we have, how the disturbance will look like. So we have several kinds of mining. We have surface mining or subsurface mining. The subsurface mining is less efficient but has less effect on surface, but you might have, you know, depression on the surface. The surface mining form large heaps, and there is, uh, you know, it's more generally more uh, dramatic. This is example of surface mining in Sokolov, just to show you some picture. And I would like to emphasize that you know, mining brings many problems. We will speak about them. Overburden differs from normal soil. Geomorphology has been changed. Water regime has been affected and so on and so forth. But many of these problems, if we think about them thoroughly, might bring some opportunities. For example, 
lack of nutrients can be suitable for restoration of closed natural oligotrophic habitats. Outer geomorphology can create potential for some use, like uh, use, uh, you know, application, getting renewable energy from wind and solar, planting some plants, which was not really uh, common before because of better exposition and so on. So when we mine the soil, when we mine the, the coal, we actually have to mine a large amount of material, which was above the coil, which we have to remove to get to the coal. This material is called overburden. And this overburden is dumped somewhere. And you know, if there is subsurface mining, this, these dumps are usually small because of a smaller amount of material. If it's surface mining, this, these heaps can be really big. And we actually distinguish, you know, external heap, which is basically inside the, the hole. They fill the pit bag, it's a backfill. And external heap. External heap is actually because uh, <clears throat> once you change these slopes, uh, <clears throat> this plastic material you generate by mining cannot be put all into the heap because it will fall down into the pit and you're still mining because they will collapse. And so you have to put part of it out of the mine and you need more land than to disturb and to affect by your mining activity. Certainly, if you have too much overburden for too little coal, your external heap would be huge and you will actually consume large amount of land. If there will be other way around, so we'll have too much coal for too little overburden, you might have a problem to reconstruct original, you know, terrain because once you remove this coal, there will be a large amount of missing material, which is usually solved by producing a mining lake, but not always this is possible, you know, you might have lack of water or something. So this is what I just said, yeah, too much overburden, external heap, too little overburden, residual lake. And then you face many stability problems, which land slope and sinkholes and so on. They are not, these problems have to be solved with, you know, discussion with some engineering expert, but we are not going to talk about them during this course. The overburden, as I said, is a material overlying the mineral layers, which has been extracted and they're very variable. Some of them are pretty good, like less quaternary sediments and so on. Some of them are quite good, like tertiary material. Some are le less good, like rock or sand. And some are really bad, like acid glass or acid sand with high metal content, high salinity, high low pH and so on. So the easiest way how to improve overburden quality is to have some budget, to have some map, and to know how much where there is this good overburden and there is this bad overburden. And make sure during your mining operation, the bad material came down and the top material and the good material came on the top. That's my require, you know, you cannot really transfer it from one place to another directly. You might need to mine the surface layer, put them on some pile, then mine bottom layer, put them on the bottom of your pit and then cover it by this stockpile material you, you store from before. As various approaches can be used, but this, is the most efficient way how to make your overburden more suitable. Certainly, mining also affect geomorphology, as I already said. Mining also affect water regime because surrounding landscape can be drained and we can protect against that by some clay walls in soil. But uh, again, this might affect the restoration effort because if there is lack of water, it's certainly more difficult. 
When we look on the overburden properties in detail, the overburden are typically materials separated during sedimentation. So compared to natural soil, they have narrow range of particle sizes. The clastic material, which are already fragmented, or material which weather fast, are actually better as a rooting material. So they are better for establishment of plant roots. But the gradual weathering, as you see on the picture on the right, may actually result in formation of pieces of various sizes, even in the you know, microscopic, I would say, level. So this actually, this is, uh, this is mudstone originally, this is clay rich overburden, but because it's compacted and because breaks down gradually, it actually allows presence of stone-like pieces, sand-like pieces and clay-like pieces at the same time, basically originating from one material. So this gradual grading actually can be good from the point of soil physics. The sandy substrates are usually poor in nutrients. The substrates which are close to coal, they are usually very acidic. And on the other hand, the clay material are usually rich in nutrients. They might have bigger sorption and so on but they have problem with permeability. Post mining overburden are extremely variable as concerned the pH. On that picture, you see a snapshot of few acres of, maybe one acre of uh, post mining land. And the numbers here actually shows pH in individual spots. So you see pH vary as much as from 2.7 to 8. And so it's highly variable. Certainly, I already mentioned extremely acidic sites are often problematic, but so do extremely alkaline sites as well. Low pH, high metal contents, or high salinity, it's the major problem of soil toxicity. And this also happened in mining sites. So basically, this is example of some phytotoxic sites in a circle of mining region. And on the right, you can see how we try to improve that by liming. And you see, you have to put quite large amount of lime, like 20 tons, to get some significant improvements. Interestingly, when we put just five tons of lime per hectare, we get even reduction of pH in water. How is that possible? Well, because these soils are very acidic. So sorption complex of this soil is saturated by hydrogen ions. And when we put uh, calcium, we actually, uh, this calcium replace these hydrogen cations in sorption complex so into the soil solution, there is at least large amount of uh, hydrogen cation, so pH drops in water. And because there is not enough cations to neutralize for that, the general outcome is actually negative. So pH is decreasing. And these are actually characteristics which depends, which actually limits the population growth of some target organisms, which was potworm in this particular case. And we actually see the lower is a pH, the, the lower is survival. We can actually see the lower is conductivity, the higher is survival. And we can actually see that the polyphenols content also negatively uh, Sorry, uh, I know, yes, uh, the more polyphenols means less survival. So it's negatively correlated with survival. And the polyphenols here are measure of coal uh, pollution. So if you have layers close to coal, which are, you know, highly uh, high conductivity, low pH, these can be phytotoxic. So the plants cannot grow there for decades until these conditions improve. Sometimes we want we not to want to wait so long. So 
you want to get rid of this phytotoxic materials. And the best idea, as I already say, is to cover the bed layer or something else during the heaping process. If we don't do so, we might actually cap it during the restoration process, which is a bit more expensive. And you might actually, you might use lime ink or gypsum for high salinity, but as you see in previous picture, you need large doses. Effect is not usually permanent. It might actually change over time and so on. So if we put some capping, you might actually pay attention, particularly in acidic sites, which are due to pyrite oxidation, that we somehow separate this topsoil layer by some breaker. And this can be, you know, a clay layer here, or it can be some level of, of gravel. The gra clay basically stops the water movement. Uh, boulders, you know, the, the gravel do not stop the downhill water movement, but it can actually prevent gravitation to climb up and to bring uh, this soil up. I already mentioned post mining sites have lack of nutrients. And we may like it for some purposes. However, sometimes we want to increase nutrient availability. The most straightforward items, straightforward approach to people might think of would be fertilization. However, industrial fertilizers are actually uh, designed to produce easy available nutrients. So if we use that, what we see, you know, in normal agriculture land, if you produce that fertilizer, more fertilizers you put, the higher is yield, and then it's stabilized and certain maximum value. If we do the same, we add different dosage of nitrogen in two post mining soil, early and late succession, year and young and old reclamation, we actually see no much added value of the fertilizer. The only inspection can be high dosage of fertilizer in reclaimed sites, particularly in old reclaimed sites. Why is that? You know, in cultured land, when we fertilize in arable land, we basically try to increase nutrient availability. But in mining land, when we fertilize, we want to restore a stock of nutrients. So that's a completely different story. Just to show you what I mean. This is an example of major pool when the nutrients are stored in natural ecosystem in United States. And you see, for most of nutrients, except of nitrogen, a majority is stored in mineral. Then there is important pool of inorganic matter, and then there is some important pool of exchangeable sorption. In soil solution, when you easy soluble fertilizer will go, is very little. So if we have land on the soil, when all this massive pool are present, by adding of this soluble nutrients, you can substantially increase the yield. But in post mining land, there is no sorption system. There is no you know, microbial community that might take nutrients in their body. The nutrients cannot store and recycle in soil. We cannot get to this pool, you know, like organic matter because there is lack of organic matter. And that's why also the efficiency of fertilization in post mining sites is very problematic. We even found that periodic application, for example, nitrogen, might make plants in post mining sites slow, worse, not better. So, Concerning uh, fertilization, we should think about, and we might use uh, some plants that promote, let's say, nitrogen fixation to increase this buildup. 
but we have to think about what we want to get. Because, you know, if we speed up this nitrogen buildup too much, we might end in another ecosystem than we usually plan for. So if we want to build up, uh, we usually are going to use some fertilizer which lasts long in soil, which will basically enhance this mineral resources. And that will be rock mail or bomb powder or stuff like that, yeah? We are not going to use, uh, you might use, but uh, would have not much long-term effect if you use, you know, ammonium nitrate, for example, or some other easy soluble uh, fertilizer, because you only instantly increase plant growth, not even long-term. And this efficiency, as I already say, is slower. Okay, to wrap this up, the post mining sites have many constraints like low or high pH, high cell content, hey, you know, improper texture, which high sand and gravel content or high clay content. And sometimes they can be hydrophobic. And this certainly affect the plant growth. Yeah? Uh, low pH can block the vegetation, uh, the same as extremely high pH, although slightly higher pH is good. High salt contents can have against negative effect on the plant growth. High sand and gravel might cause lack of nutrients and limit plant growth, while high clay might can affect infiltration and produce, you know, soil in which the roots have difficulty to grow. And hydrophobicity can reduce infiltration of water to soil. So there is different way how to solve it. Usually, you know, we can, we can use some amendments or we can use some capping. But before we do, we should also think that even that nasty places might have some potential in terms, for example, of restoring close to natural habitats. Uh, secondary problem that arise from the fact that we have large amount of soil without vegetation is erosion. So we might try wind or water erosion. So we might try to construct our sites in a way that we limit erosion. And, you know, this is actually a barriers which are made from the cutted trees in Lusatia to reduce erosion. And after that, you can just wait on succession to improve your site. Very often the site improvement in mining sites results in compaction. And compaction may be, as I already mentioned, a big problem in forest recovery and is a high connection with the way how the material is handled. So this is, for example, dumpster you know, dumping topsoil. We can certainly avoid soil compaction by, you know, deep cultivation or by production of this loose and rough surfaces, as you can show here. So these are level eight surfaces, but they can be made, you know, rough and loose, and you can plant the trees there. And this is how it looks like. It actually prevents erosion, but it also produces much better rooting medium for trees and allow rooting establishment. And it's actually cheaper than soil compaction and you know, hydro seeding. Just to illustrate how the soil compaction is bad for trees, I can show you this. This was like one or each, you know, produced by heaping machine. And we level the surface, the top, and you see there is no trees on the top. They grow on the edges. This is the same situation or similar situation. We have these very, very substrate, which was make flood here. And on this flat part, you see there is a lot of grass. And when we actually compare vegetation development, 
We might see on this wayway, there is a lot of seedlings of trees. Some of them even bigger than one meter, but there is no seedlings in this level at areas which gets more compacted. Okay, so this was some introduction to uh, reclamation approaches. Maybe I will wrap it up by picture by which I will start tomorrow. And this is basically that in different situation, you know, wet and dry, we have different potential. And then we have different possibilities what to do which are overburdened. So we can do nothing, we can make it flat, we can make it grading, we can transfer so blocks, we can transfer so topsoil, or we can even reconstruct the subsoil. And each of this brings certain potential. More you compact the soil, more you add the nutrients, it's better for grassland. Less you do that is better for trees. Certainly depends how moist you have. You know, if you have dry conditions, you should go more for grassland. If you have wet condition, you should go more for forest. So this is just to give you some underlying ecological feeling to see that conditions might determine what you want to restore in mining sites, what you can get easily, then the other options and how you can actually make work nature, nature processes to work with you and not against you. And we will go uh, more detail in how to transfer that to reclamation measures uh, tomorrow morning. Afternoon, you will see some uh, best example from India. And we have still 10 minutes to go. So I'm open to question if you have any. So there are any questions? One question. Yes. Um, also from the presentations uh, last week, it's the first time that I saw it. So in, in the Czech Republic, uh, it is used that you have these uh, waves in restoration because it's the first time that I saw it uh, because we in Germany just have like flat and at the beginning we have this heap and at the end we have this lake. So what was the reason to do it like that or do you think oh, you there is different way how you can dump your overburden so mm -hmm. you might have this this dumping machine which dump it and then they make these waves yeah and we have that when we use conveyor belt to uh, to bring the top to bring overburden in germany you might use this bricke yeah and then we'll also make these waves. Mm -hmm. And then you have option. Because this wave naturally contain a rough and loose surface. So if you are going to produce a forest, it would be actually best option to make sure that some suitable material, so some quaternary sand, for example, in a, a Lusatia came on the top and the, these waves are reasonable size, so they're manageable. You can go over it, and then you can plant tree directly without any grading. It's not done, but it would be actually, by my opinion, the optimal solution. Mm -hmm. But you might also level it. Once you level it, and you this leveling open, you know, all kinds of options. I will speak about that in next talk, but they might open all kinds of options. So you might fertilize the plot, you might uh, bring seedlings more easily and so on, but you will make compaction. And for particularly some tree species, compaction is very dramatic. It might not be so big problems in sandy substrate, but in clay substrate is a big problem. So you might certainly choose the species which can handle it, or you might use some of this deep uh, cultivation to get rid of it, or you might decide you will put a topsoil and you will go for arable land, which is good, which is, yeah. But basically, if you want a forest, it's actually good to think about if we really need to level it, for example. 
Okay, thank you. Yeah, another question. Yes, I have uh, one simple question uh, for, for more understanding. Yes. Okay, uh, from ecosystem point of view, uh, making reclamation with uh, grassland, is it recommendable than that of forest land? Like for me, yeah. making reclamation with forest land is much more suitable, just ecological. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Certainly, certainly depends where you are, yeah? So mm -hmm. if you are in the area when the forest naturally occur, mm -hmm. so you might, you know, the forest, you are in the forest zone, yeah? Your biome, your ecosystem with naturally will aim towards the forest. So you are in a, you'd say dry forest zone or you are in temperate forest zone or taiga, then I would recommend to go to forest. But mm -hmm. certainly, if you are in Wyoming, which is short grass prairie zone, mm -hmm. there is naturally no forest. There is a just a grassland. You have to go for grassland because there's no other choice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Basically, climate is not good enough to support trees. So basically, if you have that option, and if you are interested about fast recovery of ecosystem function which usually can be even more cost effective, you are right that the forest is usually a better choice. Okay. But you have to be in forest zone, yeah? Mm -hmm. This is critical because many African countries now have program, you know, Africa 100, you might hear about that. Yeah. You plant tree everywhere. And what they are going, they plant eucalyptus in the places when there was originally savannas. Yes, yes, yes. And this is actually ecological disaster. Sure. Because eucalyptus take more water than grass. They will shift carbon from below ground pool to above ground pool, make it more vulnerable to fire. Yeah. So uh, it reduces diversity, it reduces carbon storage, it reduces water scarcity for local people, uh, reduce resources for pastures and so on. Yeah. So yeah. So, so forest can be good option if you have that choice, if you are climatically in place when you have that choice. Okay. But if you are in savanna, go for grassland. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, we still have a few more minutes for question. So there will be breaking room from 12.30 to 1 p.m. We leave uh, the chat open so you can you know talk to other participants if you wish or something. But there's still a few more minutes for question if somebody wants to ask. If I was inspirative enough, I just I cannot see them all. So maybe just start to speak because I may miss someone if you just raise your hand. Okay, so basic, yes. Yes, I have a question. Uh, talking about the two categories of uh, restoration, that is uh, the either the technical restoration or the spontaneous uh, succession option. And I believe it all depends on the goal of the restoration project. And, uh, but in, in your own perspective, which is the best option in order to... Yeah, uh, you see, <laughs> as you said, depends on your aim, what you want. Yeah. So if you want to produce a rebel land, if you want to produce a rebel land, you can till and grow vegetable or, you know, uh, maize. There's no way you can get that by succession. Yeah? No way. So you have to bring topsoil, you have to bring nutrients, you know, you have to uh, make sure that there is some buildup of organic matter by growing legumes, then you have to till it and then you slowly gradually start your cultivation. But for example, if you want to restore forest, 
there is many option how to combine these two. Yeah. I will show in next speech that many times you might start succession and then succession will be actually from three species which are, you know, easy colonizing new sites, but they might not have best economic value. But they actually prepare your habitat so you can go there after that and you can purposely plant your target species because conditions are better and because they are already shaded, you do not need so much seedlings. So doing that, you might get the forest which will produce even high value timber in about the same time as if you plant it, you know, make some uh, first generation of woodland, then plant your target trees. So basically by using, so there is not really narrow edge between those two, yeah? Many times you might transfer some principles from natural succession to your reclamation practice, and you can make that way your reclamation actually cheaper and more effective. Okay. Yeah. And another important message I just uh, highlighted, but it's gonna be highlighted more. If you know what you want from your site during mining, you can actually, during mining, can make a lot of operation for free, basically, which can make your site more suitable. So you can bury the toxic site deep down. If you know you want to have you know, uh, forest, you can make your waves, your, your, your uh, surface heterogeneity suitable for planting right away. So you don't need any grading, yeah. Uh, we will speak about many other examples of that if you are producing post mining lake and so on. So sure. basically during this mining, you can bring a substrate which is suitable for your target vegetation and you can modify it in a way like that and because you anyway are moving huge amount of material this would be almost no additional cost if you would take your dumper after that it will take much more okay well, thank you so basically you know i would say it's useful to think about technical reclamation in a way that it can use natural processes rather than fight them. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we are basically are taking time for lunch, but if there is any urgent question, uh, I might still be able to answer it. If not, uh, I will come in half an hour and hopefully uh, Reginald Masto will be here and he will tell you more about a uh, uh, best example or oh, uh, best example from uh, India. Yeah. So we will meet again in 1 p.m. Uh, Central European time, which is basically 27 minutes from now. So you have time for a short uh, snack or, you know. Uh, Thank you light dinner or whatever time you have, basically. Okay, so see you in half an hour.
पीजी लिख दो Yeah, we can hear you. So now it's a lunch break to for another fifteen minutes. Yeah. So we will start. We will start in fifteen minutes from now. Yeah, but good afternoon, uh, pros. In India now, it is. Uh, 4:10. Okay, in the purely it is a late afternoon. Yeah, I know. So, so I think that it's now um, uh, we have. Um, I just we, we would have another 15 minutes. Yes. We have a break, so we will start in 15 minutes from now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sure. Okay. Okay.
Sencam asil. Okay. Do we have a next speaker? Oh, can you maybe maybe I will ask? Yeah, we already shared the screen. So if you share, if you can share your screen just to see if it's working. Yeah. Share screen. And is full screen is visible, Professor? Just a second. They say started. She's she, she's share screening. Yes, yeah, screen sharing. Maybe, maybe, wait, maybe we will came. Yeah, maybe there's a timeline. I didn't see it yet. But screen, the screen sharing is passed. I think somebody has passed. We can see that you are sharing, but we can't see any of slides. So maybe mm -hmm. try to push next slide or something. Okay. No. It's moving. No. 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 We don't. We see you are sharing, but uh, are but there is some the technical issue from your side. It says your screen sharing is fast. 
PAUACD first. It is any technical issue from your side? Anyway, I'm sharing it again. Try it again, yeah. Try it again, right. It's okay. Uh, your Yahoo mail is that page is coming. We 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 see probably your screen. Uh, there is some email list, mm -hmm. but we don't see presentation. Dr. Kumar, open your presentation first, mm -hmm. then click share screen and select yes. uh, the window where is the presentation and then click on uh, share. You have right. to oh, they, for then sharing you. Yes. Yes, perfect. perfect. We see it. Now, perfect. Uh, F F5 to run the presentation. Oh, it's uh, yeah. Yes. I think this is good enough. Perfect. Perfect. Now it's can you can that. you can you try to move to another slide so just we see yeah. it's moving. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. You can go back. So great. Okay. So and we are we have one more minute. So I will mm -hmm. I, so we will wait one more minute and I will introduce you and you, you can start. Perfect. Yeah. Less trouble than I have. <laughs> I'm, you know, teaching in that for two semesters now, but still sometimes you get to problems like this. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so it's uh, 1 p.m. Central European time and, well, many different times around the world. So, uh, I would like welcome you to afternoon part of the summer school of mining restoration. And the next uh, uh, talk will be given by Dr. Masto and who will speak us about best practices, uh, examples from India. So there will be more, uh, more, more practical insight. And tomorrow morning we will meet at 11 again and I will continue in some more systematic explanation of approaches we can use to restore forest and non-forest habitat. Okay, so uh, Dr. Masto, floor is yours. So Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Jan, for this invitation and a nice introduction. And uh, thank you for the wonderful lecture we heard in the morning. And thank uh, Agatha and others uh, for organizing this uh, seminar. Hope my voice, everything is clear to you. So, uh, Professor has uh, given me a topic on best practice examples from India. In fact, uh, we are uh, R&D, we are involved in more and research. So, most of the reclamation path is done by the mining company, whether it is moving the overburden, or leveling it, or digging a pit. Most of the part is done by the mining company. Mostly we are doing, we are uh, evaluating the success of reclamation in terms of different soil properties, soil biological properties, nutrient content, plant growth, and uh, to some extent, some of the biological properties, my microbial biomass carbon and enzymes. We didn't go deep into the microbial diversity yet. So uh, I'm with the Central Institute of Mining and Fuel Research. This is uh, one of the laboratory under Council of Scientific and Industrial Research. So this Council of Scientific and Industrial Research is responsible for um, most of the industrial research in this country. There are 38 research laboratories spread across the country. 
and we are located in Dhanbad, that's uh, called as a coal capital of India, because most of the mining uh, places, coal and other mineral mines are uh, in the state of Jharkhand. And uh, Professor Meithi, he is from Indian Institute of uh, Technology, ISM Indian School of Mines. He's also very near to us. He's hardly half an hour drive from this place. So coming to the to details of today's presentation, so I'll be focusing on uh, the following key points. So the basic introduction about mining scenario in India, reclamation of OB dumps, what we did uh, maybe a decade back, we did some reclamation work, those uh, experience we'll be sharing. Then uh, this is another study from the Dr. Meithi's work that sponge iron based dump reclamation using geotextiles. The third one is reclamation in lignite mining area. This is really, they're doing wonderful work in India in uh, lignite mines. Then geotextiles for erosion. This is coming up in India, uh, synthetic as well as uh, natural geotextiles, including jute, kyre mats are coming. And our strength is on fly ash and fly ash backfilling. That is also coming up along with the OB, both the fly ash and OB are processed together and they're backfilling the mining site. And uh, new materials for reclamation. Now recently, Professor Meithi and uh, group has started uh, using biochar for reclamation of uh, mine spoil. Uh, still, we are in the lab scale only. There's huge quantity of pro producing biochar in large quantities, uh, not a try. And finally, based on our experience, what are the challenges for reclamation? And most of the points Professor Jan has covered in the morning lecture. So since I have sufficient time, I'll go very slowly. Uh, coming to the introduction, I only want slide for introduction. Uh, as far as India is concerned, mining contributes significantly to the economy of India. Almost 2.38% uh, of the GDP is contributed by mining industries. And among the different countries in the world, India ranks fourth in the world in mine production. It's including all mines. It's not coal. If we talk about only coal, it is in third, third place. Uh, it's after China, United States, and Russia, India ranks fourth in the mine production. And there are several minerals. Almost um, 95 minerals are produced in India, out of which coal, lignite, petroleum, and natural gas are the four major minerals produced in the country. And uh, yeah, as on date, almost 1,500 mines are located in India. Many are underground and uh, almost we can say 50-50 are uh, open cast and underground mines. Coal mines, limestone, iron ore are the major mines that cover almost 50% of the Indian mines. So coal and limestone and iron ore plays a major role in terms of when we talk about for our ecologies for reclamation, because most of the coal, limestone and iron ore mines are open cast mines and it covers 50% of the Indian mines. And if you talk about the land, almost 0.1% of the total geographical area of India is occupied by mining activities. It means a mine lease. It's not exactly what reclamation is needed. Uh, the total geographical area of India is almost uh, 328 million hectares. It's uh, 328. So approximately 3 million hectares of Indian land is under and are disturbed with the mines. So with this background, Let's go with the uh, different mines because uh, uh, it's a map of India. Uh, we are located somewhere here. Hope my cursor is, cursor is visible. Yeah. And uh, more these red dots are coal mines. See, the cluster of coal mines is uh, around Jharkhand, Orissa, Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh. These are the intense. Uh, or we can say the uh, intensity of mining is more, now more mines are in this place. And we have few lignite mines down south in Tamil Nadu, Neyveli, and few lignite mines in Rajasthan, and uh, one or two lignite mines in Kutch area. So this is about uh, coal or lignite mining. And uh, in the Northeast state, one or two lignite mines, uh, not lignite mine, it's a uh, coal mine but it is uh, highly matured and uh, there's a problem with acid mine, acid mine drainage in this place. Then we have all other minerals, but if you see most of the minerals are clustered in this region. So this place, we have a lot of scope for uh, studying the mine reclamation and uh, it's one of the mandate for our institute. And recently we went into collaboration with the Professor Jan and the Indian CSAR and the Czech Academy of Science uh, 
collaborative project we have initiated due to COVID. We couldn't uh, visit or uh, we couldn't travel to check or professor couldn't travel. So hope there will be this collaboration will be fruitful. So this is about the mining situation in India and the other mines of bauxite, iron ore mines, uh, limestone, gypsum, and uh, even atomic minerals. Uh, so large number of mining sites, as I said, uh, 1,500 mining mines, active mines are present date in India. Okay, uh, it's again a fundamental thing as we talk about restoring ecology. So if you see the mining cycle, it's a temporary process. It's not uh, like other industries keep on going. It has a few years or a few decades started starting with exploration, development, extraction and uh, closer and reclamation. So each mine is having a proper mine closer plan. I'm not going into the guidelines given by our uh, government of India, Ministry of Mines. So they have a proper mine closer plan. There are many regulations and uh, it is coupled with uh, even a nominal uh, pollution control board also. So mining is a temporary land use. After the closing of mine, the land is available for alternate purpose. Maybe it is reclaimed uh, with a target ecosystem function or restored, uh, depending on the target uh, ecosystem functions to be achieved after the closure of mine. However, massive rehabilitation of the disturbed land is essential and it involves a lot of financial involvement and uh, human uh, manpower involvement is there and uh, reclamation should be thought at the beginning. Maybe uh, innovative techniques should be how to work together because at current, uh, there are several challenges for uh, successful reclamation or restoration. Mm, maybe the problem with back, uh, backfilling, contouring, sloping, and uh, there are places where after reclamation, there's massive erosion, it's destroyed everything, and uh, improper planning also some places after reclamation, again, it's got disturbed with some other activity. And uh, with this background, we'll go with the uh, statistics of reclamation status. This is the reclamation of different coal mines across the country published by uh, CMP Day, that is Central Mine Planning and Development in uh, so the central mine planning in may the major R&D station that located in Ranchi. There are different coal subsidiaries. We are uh, located in BCCL, that is Bharat Poking Coal. Dunbar is located in this place. Uh, these are the, the tall bars are the total area leased out for individual subsidiaries. And the red one is the evacuated area and the green is the area under reclamation. So if you see, uh, out of the evacuated area, less than 50 percentage is under reclamation. It depends uh, on the target, but uh, uh, as they say, government is taking a lot of initiative to push uh, mine reclamation in most of the places, and uh, they are doing it. And every year, the reclamation reports is submitted by the, um, the company, and uh, remote sensing uh, it's monitored. They pro produce the remote sensing data too. Okay, uh, coming to the problem and introduction statement, uh, open cast mining method, most of the coal mines are uh, open cast and we get uh, huge overburden materials left and it is unmanaged. Uh, the challenge particularly for India is most of the overburden is rocky. It is uh, shale, or sandstone, or sometimes a carbon rich shale. There are some overburden that is uh, burning due to self-heating can see the fumes throughout the year and sometimes say, some vegetation is also burnt out. So this is a rocky and it is heaping, maybe it's uh, 40 meters or even more than that. It's a very tall overburdens and uh, it creates a nominal pollution, complete destruction of the landform and habitat, deterioration of the aesthetic value of the land and the characteristics already uh, the last lecture we have seen, it's a high stone content. Sometimes some stone content of even up to one meter uh, with the big stones are there and no more lack of moisture. We can't depend, uh, we have to depend only on the showers, the monsoon for the plant. Uh, uh, natural succession is very poor because it's a rocky strata and no water holding capacity, high compaction that's uh, not applicable for this heap and lack of organic matter. Though we have organic matter that is more of coal shale organic matter that is not biologically active. So that's not going to help the plant material. If you see the Valkley black titration or the carbon estimation get uh, more than one or two percent carbon, but that is more of coal particles. That's not going to be helpful for 
our plant uh, or microbial growth. And uh, as I said, the improvised microbial diversity. The uh, scientific reclamation is a big challenge because of due to these all physiochemical properties and uh, soil forming process of natural succession is also to, to very low, very, very low. Okay. Uh, this is one of the case study. We did some reclamation. Uh, it's almost uh, more than uh, yeah, two decades back uh, we did. And uh, this is a kind of material available initially. It's rocky and uh, little bit dosing was done so that uh, we can access. We did uh, maybe lower bench and benches were made. Then uh, trees were, seedlings uh, were planted. What we did, uh, we dig pit and uh, in the pit we added uh, topsoil cattle manure, we call it as palmier manure, it's basically cattle manure, and asospirillum and other nitrogen fixing bacteria, uh, phosphobacteria, then uh, some cases we added mycorrhiza also in the pit, uh, the trees were planted in the pit, and uh, as and when required in some kind of uh, uh, irrigation support was given in the initial days, but afterwards, uh, once it was established for one or two years, we have to leave it alone because afterwards we can't uh, spend money for maintaining these plants. There is no fence and uh, it's free for cattle grazing also. So it's a kind of uh, uh, competition and whatever the plants that can survive all this stress that can survive. Uh, these are the big list of plant and if you go to any of the mining sites, the top three or four plants we can see the Salbizia, Talbergia, we can see uh, Acacia, Neem also. These fruit trees you won't see, uh, ficus also we can see. So for uh, academic interest, we did all these trees and uh, these last two grasses, vetiver and Simpopogon, uh, these are very good soil conservation grasses. They hold the soil together, uh, they protect the soil against uh, erosion. So these are the 17 uh, plants, trees as well as grass species we have planted. And they can see the vegetation growth in 2000. Yeah, it's two decades back, 2001 and 2002. These are some fast growing trees. And some more pictures of the site. Coming to some improvement in soil properties. Uh, quickly, I want to see the organic carbon only. Organic carbon has a mild increase in this volcanic back or carbon. So it is inclusive of uh, some of the mineralizable coal carbon too. It's not the purely the uh, litter derived or uh, root exudated derived uh, organic carbon and nitrogen content also. It's marginally increased maybe because of the nitrogen uh, biofertilizer added as well as leaf litter. Some of the trees are nitrogen fixing trees. Phosphorus, though we have, it's a total phosphorus. It's a major phosphorus. It is in a, it's available phosphorus. It is increasing. Hope this rock has a good reserve in the mineral form. Potassium also is increasing over the year. Calcium, magnesium, and all the micronutrients availability is increasing, probably due to the uh, plant uh, mineralization that organic acid sec secreted by the roots and uh, mm, decomposition of leaf litters and other organic addition to the soil. So uh, the, the overall quality is improving. Uh, here is some data on the ectomycorrhizal spores, phosphorus solution for bacteria population, total bacterial count. So over the years, we could see a mild increasing in trend. And um, this is leaf area also, some of the physiological parameters. Leaf area is also increasing the first, second, and third year. It's a difference between winter, summer, and rainy season. Again, the photosynthetic rate, it's... Uh, and it's different for different plant species. And uh, one has to select a plant that is really hardy, that can withstand the stress. Because uh, in India, we have very hot summer and uh, high rainfall. Yes, it's uh, blessed with such a beautiful uh, weather condition. So the plant has to survive by itself. After two years or three years, we can't support any irrigation or any other uh, management practice. We can invest on that. Uh, coming to the uh, ambient atmospheric uh, uh, particles, socks, NOx also, there's a slight uh, decrease in the ambient CO2 content. Like, as a soil scientist, we'll be interested in this uh, soil conservation potential of this infiltration rate. 
this is for the bare site and uh, in the canopy of different trees infiltration was more for the vetiver and this grass these are very good soil conserving grasses and uh, soil movement was drastically decreased that is the erosion erosivity of the soil is decreased so um, soil moisture content also increased litter mass so the what we can say is based on the study is these three trees that is dalbergia albizia acacia that's good for uh, plantation and they should be combined with these uh, soil conserving grasses okay coming to another uh, site it's uh, another site uh, professor meethi and his group has done and they published in 2015 Mm, this is a waste dump of an integrated sponge iron unit it's uh, basically consisting of uh, uh, waste from sponge iron the fly ash also there then uh, some kind of dolo char it's a carbon rich material I mean in a chatisgarh the height is almost 40 to 50 meter and slopes very steep deep slope steep slope and the material was highly alkaline and uh, consists of as i said slag fly ash and dolo char this is the initial site and afterwards it was uh, the lay a layer of top soil good soil was added then geotextile except basically coir mat was added to protect against erosion coir mat and top soil was used to create a substratum for germination and growth of seeds and uh, after an year or two we can see how the greeneries so uh, basically they used a mixture of grass and legume seeds penicillium stylosanthus and uh, these are uh, crotalaria these are the legume seeds sesbania this is a very fast growing hibiscus both the seed mixtures were used for revegetation and in the brims uh, in the brim area again the symbophogan and asadi reactor was used for stabilization of this thing so this is a, a very good mulch was created and uh, that i can imagine the quantum of organic matter is added to that and most of these layers are nitrogen fixing legumes and this is uh, stabilized okay so now we are going to a, a different site the third site is lignite mining area this is in the southern part of india where the they they are very active in reclamation they are uh, very very active in reclamation activities this is the, we call it as naveli lignite mining corporation this is a mine and uh, they have mine at barsing at rajasthan also in the northern part of india also they have one or two mines in rajasthan the average stripping ratio is 1 is to 5 ob thickness 45 to 110 meters so to reach the lignite they have to go deep down to 30 meters deep and soil evacuated uh, is backfill here the ob is not rocky so it's a very interesting material it's uh, like a kind of soil laterating soil then down is rigolith deep down till the lignite seam or lignite layers also it is rigolith and uh, slope is established by conventional mining equipment top soil is used for forestation okay uh, what they do is they dig pit uh, of 60 by 60 into 60 60 meter width the 60 meter depth and 60 meter length it's a kind of pit and the pit was filled with red deer cattle manure mixture coir pit fly ash lignite ash it is basically uh, this mine has a pit head uh, power plant the power plant is located just adjacent to the mine so they can easily get the fly ash back into the mine and mix it along with the fly ash they added uh, biofertilizer asospirillum phosphobacteria mycorrhiza and humic acid this humic acid is also extracted from um, the lignite they have a process alkali treatment of lignite and uh, potassium basically they treat the lignite with potassium hydroxide to get potassium humate and uh, for a pesticide a neem cake is added it's a extract from asadi reactor maybe it's against for some of the soil insects or pathogens and diammonium phosphate fertilizer was added so all these mixtures were added and it was planted and the tree saplings were planted initially they were planted with a very close spacing and as it uh, establish there they, they go for gap filling or sometimes they go for thinning also and weeding and irrigation was done for the initial few years and uh, this is a kind of uh, greeneries that was developed after 2 to 3 years 
Okay. Yeah, interestingly, it's not only trees. They could see the birds and other uh, peacock inhabiting the place after reclamation. And they converted some of the low-lying area into a beautiful place where the one can, can go for boating or can attract tourists also. It's one of the best mining company where the reclamation practices are very good, particularly for coal and lignite. And there are good mining companies are there for zinc and other minerals. But among coal and minerals, uh, lignite is a uh, Naveli Lignite Corporation. They do good job in reclamation. Okay. Yeah, this is another activity where the, after reclamation, this was used for agriculture purpose. That uh, the previous study was for growing uh, trees. In this uh, reclamation, initially they leveled it and they plowed it. And it's a kind of techno soil, artificial soil. They added the sawdust, the huge quantity of sawdust and huge quantity of gyps, uh, lignite dust, lignite powder, gypsum, urea, cattle manure, press mud. Press mud is the organic waste that is derived from uh, sugarcane industry. After crushing sugar, it's a thick uh, organic uh, waste that is derived from sugarcane industry. So all this mixture were uh, plowed and puddled. So for paddy, this uh, cultivation, for paddy cultivation, the soil to be puddled in wet condition and uh, paddy seedlings are transplanted. Okay, the seedlings are transplanted from the nursery. So they could develop a good uh, paddy field. Uh, there's one more practice also, the 30 or 50 days before uh, transplanting paddy, they go for sesbanium. It's an, uh, we call locally danger. It's a nitrogen fixing legume. So after uh, maybe one meter growth, uh, they plow it again back into the soil. So that adds a lot of nitrogen and organics. Uh, so 30 or 50 days before, so the transplanting paddy, the sesbania is incorporated just before transplantation. Okay, so this is a beautiful scenario of uh, paddy cultivation on the mine spoil. And we did some uh, soil and other analysis also. There is no carryover of trace and heavy metals. We have compared with the exposure risk and some samples were sent to nutrition lab also. And uh, some samples they fed to animals and found there's no problem with the carryover of any trace and heavy metals. Yeah, this is the, this, uh, yeah, in fact, this experiment was done by, this is a separate experiment. This was done by our institute. Uh, basically, we added press mud and no press mud, then fly ash. Fly ash was added as different doses, 5 tons, 10 tons per hectare, 20 tons, 50 tons, 100 tons, and 200 tons. This is for the first season, second crop, and uh, this was continued for the three to four years, this sixth crop. So you can see there's a gap because I am presenting only the rice. This is the paddy crop. See, over the years, the performance and the productivity is increasing. In the first year, the productivity was low, but over the year, the productivity is increasing. Even with press med or without press med, the productivity is better. But in the initial years, too much of uh, fly ash, it's dangerous. It's uh, 200 tons and 100 tons of fly ash was added and plowed to, uh, along with the soil. So the initial years, fly ash was reactive and uh, maybe some negative impact on the crop, but in the next third, fifth and sixth crop, it is almost on par with the other dose. So it's an opportunity for the mining company to dispose a huge quantity of fly ash, as fly ash disposal is a challenge. Mm, uh, basically, uh, we get fly ash and bottom ash. Fly ash, cement industry takes, but for bottom ash, there's no market demand. We have to push the bottom ash to agriculture sector, uh, brick making. So uh, mine filling and uh, for reclamation of this kind of uh, mine spoil, the use of fly ash is a good opportunity and uh, it's a very specific advantage for this mining company because their um, mine as well as the power plant are side by side. The power plant is located in the mine pitted so they can recycle back the fly ash to the mines. So this is another interesting study on uh, converting the mine spoil for agriculture purpose and agriculture land. Okay, but geotextile, basically we didn't do much work and it's uh, uh, other group, it's a work of Vedanta. Um, basically there are um, synthetic geotextiles as well as um, organic. 
basically synthetic they may go for uh, seepage control for uh, water movement uh, for conveying water or uh, drainage channels basically organic they take from jute or coir coir is uh, waste material from coconut coconut husk or uh, other industrial waste organic uh, synthetic uh, things are there for uh, stabilizing the slope and seedlings were grown on that so this is a situation from vedanta it's another mining company Mm, the advantage is it absorbs a lot of water. They say with this um, mat. Hello, yeah, this mat takes almost five times uh, water, and uh, it more controls the temperature. It uh, creates a favorable microclimate uh, in between the mine spoil and the mat. So it's good for the um, organisms as well as plant roots, since it is a Organic material, it's porous. It's not uh, affecting the gas exchange with the soil. And it's create a very favorable microclimate that promotes microbial growth as well as plant root and uh, prevent rain splash. The rain drops doesn't have direct impact on the soil. So erosion or uh, the severity of erosion is controlled. Uh, but obviously there should be proper drainage channels. Otherwise the entire game will be spoiled because this material is loose. It's not rocky material. So in India, we have varieties of material. It's lateritic. If you see any iron ore mines, this kind of lateritic material you get. Uh, and it's prone to erosion. In the downstream, we can see red color water uh, leaching all this uh, lateritic material. So uh, different kinds of mining materials, uh, OB materials are available, starting from rocky to loose fragments. Even in some coal mines, you get loose soil kind of regolith. Okay, uh, this is a purely an academic interest study we did long back. Um, so uh, what happens, the plant has an impact on the soil property, right? Plant has an impact on the soil property, on the impact on the soil, microbial diversity, impact on the um, nutrients availability. Basically, the plant interacts with the soil through rhizosphere. That is the zone uh, very close to the root. There's a lot of interaction between plant and soil. And uh, other interaction is uh, some leaf fall and the litter is falling and it adds organic matter to the soil. So what we hypothesize is that after three, four years, the plant has to survive by itself. So we did the rhizosphere soil quality index, soil microbial index. And uh, we hypothesize that tree species that have very good score for this rhizosphere quality, they can sustain by itself without any extra support after three years. So we screen some trees uh, growing naturally in the mining areas and uh, unmined areas also. And um, we developed an index, Rhizosphere Soil Microbial Index. And um, I was excited that paper was uh, published in Soil Biology and Biochemistry. Uh, we did uh, dehydrogenase, phenol oxidase, microbial biomass carbon, basal uh, respiration ratio, microbial quotient, all these ratios also we did. We did the calculation and we developed an index and we hypothesized Tree species having a score more than 0.5 may be recommended for uh, the plantation. So we could get uh, Agel, Mar Marmelos, Bokinville, Eugenia, Jambulana. These are very neat, not exotic. These are very neat species. Asadiracta indica, Dalberge, Sisu. And uh, some of the species you may be teak. People are interested in planting teak, but that is just marginally, it's coming close to the 0.5 score. Moringa olifera is good. So uh, it's a uh, purely academic interest. Maybe some we, can, we didn't validate it. So some uh, trees could be screened out for its suitability for reclamation purpose based on the rhizosphere chemistry or rhizosphere microbial properties. OK. Uh, we developed some index also, soil microbial, uh, the mine soil quality index. Uh, probably Dr. Sangeeta has presented that in the conference. So I'm not going to the details. Again, this is a chrono sequence site. You can see over the years how the score is increasing. And this is for the forest. Uh, it's almost Sorry, comparable man. with the forest. OK. Thank you. Yeah, it's unnoted. Now, after 17 years, uh, the um, 
soil quality index is comparable with the reference that's of a nearby forest site. So this is also another tool and we use uh, these parameters, soil carbon, uh, CO2 flux, dehydrogenous activity, coarse fraction, uh, soil moisture content, base saturation, all these parameters were, uh, uh, these were selected based on principal component analysis and we have validated this index also. This index were correlated with the total biomass yield and uh, we could get good correlation. So this index, uh, normally this is index are used uh, widely in agriculture soils for uh, evaluating the performance of management system. The fertilizer system maybe it was basically developed by Doran and Carlin long back uh, to see the conventional farming and uh, these uh, traditional farming systems. Okay. So in mine soil also we can try this and uh, we could get a very interesting result over the year in the chrono sequence side, the scores increased, linearly the score increased. Okay. Oh, the slides are moving, right. And uh, now it's not carbon storage also. We tried, uh, we calculated the carbon storage in the mine spoil. So um, uh, actually basically mine spoils are divided up uh, soil carbon, therefore they provide an excellent opportunity. These trees can provide an excellent opportunity for above ground as well as below ground carbon storage in the mine spoil. So we did some studies of uh, the same chrono sequence sites we used. Uh, net carbon storage in the ecosystem was calculated. I'll, uh, yeah, this is a detailed methodology. I'm not going to be a, use a hypsometer to measure the plant height and the TBH. This is the girth at um, breast height. Then we use some functions to calculate the total biomass, above ground biomass. And again, some um, functions that is uh, some percentage of the biomass uh, goes down as a root. We use some uh, hypothesis, uh, not hypothesis, empirical formulas to calculate the carbon storage in the mine spoil. Yeah. And this is the, uh, after it is from a single site, after 14 years, what happened? These are the different tree species, DBH height, wood specific gravity. You can go directly to total biomass, stem carbon, root carbon, and total carbon, okay? Total carbon was uh, higher for uh, uh, Dalberger's issue. And other trees also, it's comparable, but statistically, yeah, it's comparable. Statistically, the Delonyx regia, Cassia, Siamia, all are comparable. So uh, it's again an interesting area for uh, carbon storage and carbon credit one can go with uh, mine spoil. And, uh, uh, if this is for trees, maybe for grassland also one can calculate and see that how much carbon is stored. So since we could get a good result for Dalbojas issue, we did, uh, then we again went into chrono sequence site. Yeah, before chrono sequence site, let me uh, see some of the economic interest uh, studies we did. So basically the leaf litter and the twigs, they fall on the ground and they add to the carbon. So we characterize the cellulose, chemicellulose and uh, acid soluble lignin and other lignin extractives in the plant material. And we have studied the thermal stability of that in the TGA. You can see the leaf is more thermally stable than root carbon or twig carbon. Uh, there could be mixed reasons. It's due, due to the aromatic, not aromatic carbon. It's basically due to the more silica content in the uh, leaf. So we did some FTI studies also. And um, we can use a factor of 0.3 because when the leaf goes, almost 60 to 70 percentage of the carbon will be lost back to the atmosphere. At least uh, 0.3 or 20 percentage of the carbon can remain in the soil. Okay, and then we went into a chrono sequence site from two to 16 years. What is the storage of um, carbon in a Dalberger Sisu? As Dalberger Sisu, we could see an exponential increase in the total carbon in the system. And this is the soil carbon stock or below ground carbon stock. And this is the total carbon stock. And soil carbon stock is uh, increasing linearly. So interestingly, it has not yet come to the equilibrium. There's further scope to increase it. And uh, in case of biomass carbon, maybe initial phases, there is a limitation. Maybe in the initial 10 years, the soil ecosystem functioning, functions are developing. 
maybe it's coming to a near normal situation so there's a there are challenges for the plant to grow in the initial years then after 10 years the growth is high it again they depends on the nature of physiology of the nature of the plant species too so uh, very interesting data we could get uh, in a chrono sequence site when uh, we calculated the carbon storage above ground and below ground okay so uh, the conclusion is uh, tree species are mindful well improved physical property as soil quality was improved then dalbergia susu contributed for soil carbon storage and it increased exponentially okay now we are going into a completely different set of topic now till now we have talked about the reclamation now i am talking of the materials that could be used for reclamation today i'll be focusing on two materials one is fly ash that is the waste derived from uh, coal combustion in power plants the other one is biochar uh, really in biochar we didn't do much work but fly ash we did a uh, good amount of work on fly ash so when we burn coal in the power plant in the boiler some of the ash particles come with the flue that are collected using electrostatic precipitator they are uh, the esps they are called fly ash okay and some particles goes down the boiler they are heavy they are collected in water they are called water mass or bed ash fly ash has good market value because uh, it's not interacted with water mostly cement industries they take the fly ash but water mash has very less value because the particle size is coarse and there are clinkers also so the water mash normally they store in the, the pond but in some industries even the water mash is also going out so there's a good opportunity to use the water mash to in reclamation why because the water mash and the fly ash are contain good amount of plant nutrients basically these are coal and related to the plant ancient plant so the nutrients are enriched in the fly ash and um, most of the nutrients are present in the glassy phase they are not in the easily available form like uh, if you add to mine spoil it can it will go in the mineral phase insoluble phase or slowly over the years it can be released because of the high temperature in the boiler the coal is burned at uh, 1100 degree in the boiler so most of the potassium uh, pot phosphorus potassium calcium they go into glassy phase they are slowly available not easily available okay so quickly i'll review the properties of uh, fly ash uh, how it affects the soil property uh, fly ash as far as bulk density is concerned fly ash are lighter than the soil the density of fly ash is uh, around 1.1 or 1.2 but soil bulk density is 1.5 or 1.4 so its application decreases the overall bulk density and uh, increases the porosity of the soil fly ash have irregular shaped particles aids in loose packing of soil so some of the compaction problem can be solved by mixing uh, fly ash with the soil then it increases the water holding capacity as it decreases bulk density and the porosity is increases the water holding capacity of the strata could be increased and um, a porous structure can be developed infiltration rate could be improved because of the permeability and uh, surface bulk density is decrease and surface porosity is increase so the infiltration rate could be increased by adding fly ash other properties uh, hydraulic conductivity also can be improved erodibility use of fly ash decrease erodibility by modifying the permeability character so the water seeps inside permeability is also increase soil aggregation increase because of the pozzolanic properties the uh, fly ash contain active silica so when it reacts with calcium or uh, both silica and calcium are there in most of the fly ash so that's why they it is used in cement industry so in the soil also depending on the chemistries of the soil it helps in formation of aggregates okay and uh, some of the chemical properties um, uh, worldwide we cannot go for a generalization that in, in india most of the fly ash are alkaline and uh, we don't have any problem with the heavy metals so the fly ash doesn't have enrichment of any heavy metal but i heard some of the us fly ash are enriched with some potentially toxic elements so it depends on the geochemistry of the coal geological condition of the coal but in indian fly ash they are alkaline um, due to presence of hydroxide and carbonate salt so uh, it decrease the metal availability in mine spoil cationic material availability in mine spoil and the electrical conductivity may increase uh depending on the nature of the fly ash if it is a lignite fly ash electrical conductivity increase because the soluble fractions are more in lignite ash 
and biomass as is also coming up uh, there are few biomass based power plant their electrical conductivity is too high and nutrient content since as i said uh, the coal is uh, an ancient plant material so most of the major nutrients uh, except nitrogen is present nitrogen is lost in the power plant during combustion at high temperature of 1100 degree most of the nitrogen is lost some sulfur is lost but in the est it is again at a cooler region it uh, get contents back otherwise at this temperature sulfur will not stay sulfur and potassium will not stay but some sulfur and potassium is retained but most of the sulfur and potassium will be lost as flue gas so uh, as an agriculturist or uh, reclamation scientist we can say fly ash contain good amount of nutrients useful for the plants cation exchange capacity decrease because it decrease uh, that um, most amorphous material fly ash doesn't have active site well quickly we'll see organic carbon fly ash doesn't have organic carbon but over the year it increase the organic carbon because it loosen the soil it uh, enables good root growth plant root can proliferate very nicely in fly ash added soil maybe in the initial years it may takes for the chemical reactions to stabilize or some of the soluble components get leached down but after two or three years you get very good result after adding fly ash and as i said it should be used with caution because some fly ash contain potentially toxic elements that may be that could be harmful so periodical monitoring is there in india the pollution control board has given a guidelines for using fly ash for mine backfilling Mm, every year we have to measure a set of uh, trace metals and there should be piezometer stations to collect the leachate from the backfilled area and the leachate should be monitored uh, periodically and uh, for precaution a uh, certain distance should be there between the backfilling area and the water bodies so suppose a river is running or uh, some kind of a pond is there there should be proper distance should be maintained uh, while backfilling fly ash normally they use fly ash and ob materials together mixed together and they backfill it and fly ash may contain organic pollutants uh, depending on the presence of unburned carbon polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons our study shows that um, coal ash doesn't have for ph but biomass ash since the combustion efficiency is less in biomass power plants they have polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons okay so um, just a moment yeah again going into some details of fly ash if you see compare the fly ash with the soil the sand content in fly ash is less sand content means uh, particles of size uh, 2 mm and silt content less than uh, 0.2 mm is 0.2 to 2 mm less than 0.2 mm is uh, fly ash has a very good amount of silt silt size particle i won't say call it as silt silt size particles are there compared to soil and if you see the mine soil we have very poor texture mostly it is coarse sandy or gravelly so this fly ash can improve the textural properties of the mine soil and uh, clay is less in fact uh, very fine particles are not there much so the silt content in more silt content in fly ash it's a favorable property for using fly ash in mine soil reclamation as i said bulk density is less water holding capacity is more porosity is more electrical conductivity is comparable with the soil but yeah there are some typical lignite ash biomass ash where electrical conductivity is very high and most of the indian fly ash are alkaline so these are some of the favorable properties when we compare the with the soil yeah, it has an added advantage and nutrients also see good amount of nutrient is there 1.6 percentage potassium is not percentage sorry it's in ppm it's available nutrient but the total nutrient when they are coming slides i am showing the total nutrients so uh, plant nutrients is also available basically it's an ancient plant material polyphyte and uh, got composted in power plant so we believe uh, fly ash would be a good material for uh, mixing with uh, mine soil for reclamation coming to some of our studies uh, uh, difference between fly ash and bottom ash see uh, this is in percentage as mostly it is in fly ash not in bottom ash most of the nutrients are enriched in fly ash not in bottom ash because bottom ash uh, it get reacted with water and uh, it depends on the volatility of the elements some elements are uh, volatile or mild volatile also they go to the fly ash the elements that are non volatile 
that only will come to the bottom mesh. So uh, this is the coal. And uh, since uh, the carbon is last, most of the elements are enriched in fly ash. After burning, so you'll get a concentrated amount of nutrients in the fly ash. Okay. And some of the transient elements, trace heavy metals also present. We'll see the chemical fractionation of that. Yeah. This is um, chemical fractionation of the fly ash. We have fractionated the nutrient content into soluble form, exchangeable form, the nutrients that are bound to carbonates, bound to metal oxides, organic matter, and residual fractions. We followed a sequential extraction procedure. Initially, we took uh, fly ash, uh, we shake with water, then again with another chemical, other chemical with increasing aggressiveness. And finally, it is a residual form we use HF. If you see, most of these elements are in the saffron color. Most of the elements are in residual form. It, it's not easily available. It's not mobile. So when we add this, even the, in fly ash, potassium is in the non-available form. So, but over the years, it is slowly available. So it is good for establishing a, a kind of um, good uh, restoration than an agriculture soil. As Professor Jan was mentioning in the last presentation, in agriculture soil, we want to increase the available nutrient, but for a natural system or for a reclaimed mine site, it is more of, a, we should focus on the mineral matter type of in slowly soluble nutrients. For, and the transient elements also in the non-available form. This is a coal ash. This is also coal ash. It's a lignite ash. Lignite ash, slightly different because the there's a slight release from the residual fraction to the next fraction. But if you see the biomass, uh, most of the association is in unfavorable, unfavorable forms. Most of the elements are in soluble or uh, bioavailable forms. If you see potassium, for example, the trend has changed. So uh, for European countries, I know the lot of biomass-based power plants are there. So one should be cautious when we are adding biomass as to mine spoil reclamation. So what we see is we are extracting the nutrients. Before adding for the soil, what we can do is we can go for washing of the ash and we get mostly soluble potassium chloride and potassium sulfate that are good fertilizers. We can process it. And after washing, this uh, biomass ash can be uh, added to the soil because um, maybe particularly in India, biomass-based power plants are not that much, uh, not, not that many. But I, I'm sure in Europe, a uh, large number of biomass-based power plants are there. So those ashes could be used for uh, mine spoil reclamation, provided the uh, transient elements like cadmium are not in the soluble form. See the cadmium here, but in coal ash, it is in the insoluble form. It's due to the temperature of combustion. Because uh, these plants operate at 1100 degrees. These plants operate at around 800 because uh, if we operate biomass plant at more than 800 degrees, the, everything will get melt. We have potassium, phosphorus, calcium, will all melt and it will choke the boiler. We can't go for high temperature. Maybe advanced combustion techno technologies, I'm, I'm, I'm going to comment on that. Uh, but the, the reality is in biomass, the chemical fraction is completely different. So uh, these two are uh, biomass ash, or lignite ash, or coal ash. These are wonderful materials that can be added uh, to mine spoil to improve the nutrient contents as well as to improve the um, physical properties of the uh, mine spoil. Okay, coming to our uh, study on mine spoil, this is again a low-lying mine land. We filled with uh, fly ash. We filled the low-lying area with fly ash. Uh, we leveled it and dosed it, it was compacted. And the same uh, reclamation strategy was followed. It is uh, 45 into 45 into 45 centimeter pit. And on the pit, um, good soil was added and um, cattle manure, nitrogenous fertilizer, nitrogen fixing bacteria, phosphorus solubilizing bacteria were added. And uh, this was demonstrated for agriculture crops as well as um, horticulture crops and some uh, tree species, vetiver, uh, erosion resistant plant. And uh, uh, we could see improvement in the fertilizer uh, fertility of the plant. And uh, most of the plants uh, survived, except some typical species uh, like banana could not survive. And uh, plants that are coming from tissue culture farms because they can uh, take less shock. Uh, tissue culture banana, they couldn't survive much. And uh, we have measured the photosynthetic rate and other uh, physiological parameters was good. And uh, significant decrease in runoff and uh, 
Yeah, but the, uh, for any ash filling, a periodical monitoring is needed. Yeah, so we, uh, to dispel any leaching of potential toxic element because our regulatory guidelines also says that uh, after filling, we have to monitor the mobility of trace elements and other potentially toxic elements down the profile. Okay, so uh, this is the first material we have covered, fly ash. Uh, this is in practice. Many mining companies are adding it. Even it is used in underground mines like space fill. Even in the open cast mines and other low-lying area, it is mixed with other materials, OB materials, as well as it is processed also. So now coming to the other new material, that's biochar. So um, uh, I'll quickly go through it. I have, I think, time. I have another uh, at least 20, 30 minutes. So uh, biochar is the carbonized plant material. Maybe if we have a large amount of agricultural residues or other biomass waste, we can carbonize it. Why it is important? Uh, if we add directly the carbon into the soil, most of the carbon will go and only 10% carbon will go into the humus. Most of them will go back, get mineralized and go back to the atmosphere like plant biomass, waste and crop residues, most of them are level carbon or volatile carbon and say, this will go back to the atmosphere. But if we convert uh, that into biochar, uh, the mass balance says almost 50% of the carbon can go into the stable pool. Alternatively, if we burn it, everything will go into the atmosphere. So that's the reason biochar is um, carbon neutral or carbon positive, we can say. It's stable in soil for several thousand years, and um, soil carbon pool is also globally is very important. It's an innovative approach. Normally, it's uh, the last decade, there is tremendous amount of literature has come for agriculture soil. But uh, hopefully for uh, mine spoil, it is very less. Recently, Dr. Meithi has, uh, and his group has published. Otherwise, for um, mine spoil, I believe it is still a lot of, a lot of scope is there for adding biochar also. So uh, we optimize the process for biochar preparation. We use the waste uh, biomasses like water has and uh, parthenium. And uh, yeah, this is a very interesting structure. The surface area is increased when we convert the biochar, uh, biomass into biochar. This is the picture uh, of, um, okay, it's 5000X. Yeah, it is of the same magnification. See, this is the biomass. In the same area, there are so many streaks are there, but you see the number of streaks, it gets swollen. So when we convert the biomass to biochar, the volatile gases inside the biomass gases out of the biomass, so it swells the material. That's why it increases the surface area. Tremendously, the surface area is increased, the microporosity and surface area is increased. So with increase in temperature also, the surface area is increased. And uh, there are several other properties also. The surface charges, um, they act as a, a stain sites that can hold some of the cationic nutrients. And, uh, mm, and biochar is again, this carbon is not biologically active, but the recent study says some fraction of biochar carbon is biologically active. Unlike coal is uh, very hard, uh, hot carbon, coal or shale is very hot. But this biochar carbon, some fraction is uh, biologically active that can be used by microorganisms. So there's a lot of scope for using biochar into the mine spoil. The only thing is we need to have a system for pooling the biomass system to prepare the biochar. It should be a pyrolysis plant and that energy uh, using pyrolysis, that energy should be sustainably used. And when we convert the, when we convert the char in the straw into biochar, the carbon content is enriched. So up to certain temperature, it increases. Then uh, after the high temperature, the carbon content decreases. So even in wheat straw also, it has increased up to 400 degrees. Then at 500, the carbon content decreases. So it's an advantage uh, to conserve carbon as we talk about um, uh, carbon storage in mine spoil. So that can be integrated with biochar, uh, depending on the availability of the biomass waste. Bio biochar can be added to mine spoil. And it is having very tremendous properties, very wonderful properties that improves the soil quality and accordingly the plant growth, particularly the root proliferation can improve. This is the enrichment factor of carbon. When we convert the plant material into biochar, almost uh, 
1.5 times and 1.6 times the carbon content could be increased when we convert the biomass to biochar. And uh, regarding carbon stability, it's a van Krellwellen and part plot. It's uh, O by C ratio and H by C ratio. When we plot it, uh, you see, this is the original biomass. And these are the biochar. It is coming close to coal and lignite. So we can easily convert it into, when we convert the bio, bio, so biomass into biochar, this carbon stability is just, please give me a moment. No, hello. Uh, sir, I'm meeting my subject with WG, sir. Any absence, sir? Think that's our quality box, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, the uh, stability of the carbon is increased um, when we convert the biomass to biochar. Okay. And it is comparable with lignite. The carbon stability is comparable to lignite. So it's again uh, in terms of uh, the carbon storage, it is stable in the soil for thousands of years. One moment. Hello. Hello. Well, it is due to condensed aromatic polymers. The aromatic carbon is more in biochar that uh, FTA studies also confirm that in the fingerprint region, we could get uh, good signals for uh, the biomass. The, not the cellulose, cellulose is last. We get um, lignin get transformed into aromatic structures. Aromaticity increased when the biomass material are converted into biochar. And thermal stability also. This is a TGA, thermogravimetric analysis. Uh, this is the original biomass and biochar. The thermal stability is increased and there's a shift in energy reactivity also. The reactivity decreases. This is for the original biomass. So hardly maybe 20, 25 degree temperature more is needed to burn out the biochar carbon. So uh, FTI studies also shows OC, Van Krillen also supports the biochar carbon is stable. So these are very fundamental studies. Now, Another thing is uh, we used a um, uh, notorious weed, parthenium. It's called Congress grass. I don't know uh, Europe, but because this is a dangerous, it's called milk disease in cattle. So it contains some alkaloids, ambrosin. So you can uh, carefully see the GCMS plot. This is for the original biomass. And this is um, for the, yeah, the bottom one is for the um, biochar and the red one is for the biomass. So in the original biomass, all the, toxic chemicals, uh, alkaloids are there. So the alkaloids get uh, degraded, thermally degraded, and the biochar has safe carbon. So there's no uh, worry of uh, taking the toxic substance into the field. So at the temperature of 300 degree or 400 degree, these all volatile toxic chemicals are burnt out. So uh, parthenium is a dangerous weed. There are other plants also that has some uh, allelopathic chemicals that can be avoided when we convert this into biochar. Some of the, even the plant litters have allelopathic effect. Now, if you see some, uh, uh, below some plants, we can't see some grass development, no grasses are coming up. So this biochar system could be a good method to protect the soil. And it's uh, toxic to soil microorganism too. Okay, we uh, did some studies on um, mine spoil, laboratory study. Mine spoil was amended with uh, plant litter fly ash, formian manure, as well as biochar, okay? So it's combining both the material, fly ash and biochar also. We could see uh, two sets of curve. The carbon mineralization was decreased in presence of fly ash. So when we add fly ash, the carbon mineralization is decreased. They said uh, there are several hypotheses. Um, Jim Amanet, um, they say that they create some micro anaerobic conditions in this. Soil. There are pockets of microanaerobic conditions when we add fly ash. So that's uh, some niche area where the uh, carbon mineralization is less. So there are several other reasons. This fly ash um, has um, polyphenol, polyphenol uh, components. If, if some unbanned carbon is there, they affect the polyphenolase. They not affect, they enhance the polyphenols activity. So it helps in conversion of uh, labile carbon to humic carbon. There are several hypotheses, but our study clearly shows 
when we add fly ash over the 300 days the carbon mineralization rate is decreased so the plant litter can be preserved inside the soil it's a kind of manipulating it and uh, uh, storing more carbon in the soil but it's not true for biochar because biochar is already stable did some pot experiment also recently a psc student did some pot experiment also and uh, we could get a favorable result for my reclaiming mine spoil this is a coal mine spoil mixed with biochar and uh, zea maize was grown as a test plant and we could get a good result and this is published also in soil use and management and um, another work also mine spoil added with biochar mine spoil plus biochar and compost <coughs> mine spoil plus biochar plus compost also these are some uh, laboratory study and we could see a tremendous increase in the plant yield over the control site when we add mine spoil plus biochar plus compost and the soil properties soil enzymes microbial biomass carbon also increase when <coughs> mine spoil was added with biochar and compost okay uh, we did some calculation on the life cycle assessment how much carbon is conserved when we add bio biochar but paddy straw gives a very negative report because paddy straw um, the carbon uh, conservation is less because uh, in india the paddy is grown in waterlogged condition and there's a lot of methane emission during pad paddy cultivation so if we see the life cycle in totality uh, it's not uh, favorable for carbon credit wheat straw maize straw water hyacinth the pathenium and the lantana camber these are all good candidates for uh, carbon credits we uh, considered even npk needed uh, and uh, the carbon emitted uh, during its manufacture but in fact it's not for the mine spoil we did for agriculture side so it's a very interesting material and there's a lot of scope for uh, storing carbon in mine spoil using biochar okay and uh, i'm coming to the almost the end of the presentation we have hardly one more slide so what are the challenges for uh, So mine land reclamation in India. With my limited exposure, because I have not travelled across the country, with my limited exposure, what I say is first is uh, some mines quite a stony, mm, stony substrate with uh, deep slopes. See the slopes are very deep, but we have access from the other side. The slopes are very deep and uh, prone to erosion, accelerated erosion, and uh, not only erosion here, and the maybe the roadway and the path get uh, silted because. there are the interesting obis this obi is more of rocky and if we go to the northern coal fields it is a kind of a fine powdery kind of obi regolith material and um, fire in this kind of obi the carbonaceous shale yeah, i have seen recently a site where the well grown trees were burnt out because of the natural combustion of the shale carbonaceous shale car carboniferous shale carbon content is high in that shale at uh, in summer due to the intense heat and uh, moisture they got uh, the catch fire uh, fire due to the carboniferous shale then toxic chemicals see a kind of uh, pyritic outcrop in the lignite mines uh, we have seen there uh, sulfur is coming up toxic chemicals are there then most of these areas have adverse climatic conditions so very difficult for the plant to survive adverse edaphic conditions soil conditions as well as uh, above ground climatic conditions also very rough and grazing it's not protected it's uh, grazing and at times uh, improper planning in technically as well as uh, in policy wise also because um, uh, proper erosion control was not maintained then uh, they never expected a huge rain so it washed everything it washed away everything then sometime Mm, the obi was again dumped back even vegetated or natural succession over the natural succession sometimes new obis were added so these are some of the challenges maybe in the field there could be more challenges too and uh, finally thank you for uh, patient listening and we have you know, sufficient time for discussion if you have any doubts we can ask thank you Maybe 
Uh, yeah, this, this the name cake you used for uh, the recultivation of uh, trees, uh, this is against uh, insects or nematodes or both, or so against oh. some, some insects in soil or so? Yeah, we have not yet studied, but now we are planning with uh, uh, Jan, Professor Jan, we are uh, planning to study that across different mm -hmm. climatic conditions. We're going to study some insects and nematodes. Okay, and and how is it produced? It's just uh, a waste material from from neem oil production, or is it uh, just from the leaves, or how is it produced? Uh, which one, the biochar? No, the, the neem cake. Neem cake. It's um, it's produced from uh, neem uh, seed. Neem is Asa directa indica. There's a tree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that seed it's produced from that seed. Okay. The seed is crushed and uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I can see Professor Frost. So thank you very much, Mr. Kumar. We have about 20 minutes to some other question. If somebody has some or I can see there is no raising hands. <laughs> Feel free. I have, uh... Yeah, I, uh, Professor Eske Maiti, I have the, not a question, it is a suggestion. Dr. Masto, you will agree yes, that, uh, no, all our reclamation study or ecological restoration study in India, whether it is coal, iron ore, or lignite, our funnel component, and nobody is studying, or it is totally lacking, I should say. Totally, totally lacking. Since mm -hmm. uh, 1980s, when you started initial work, 1990. So yeah. I am very much hopeful once we have collaboration with uh, Professor Jain in your CSIR. Uh, I think uh, our this funnel, role of funnel component on ecological restoration, of my yes, land, will start. Yeah. yeah, sure, sure, sir. From the geo. That's the issue. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, sir. Definitely, we'll be doing that. And this year, we couldn't do that due to this COVID situation. Sir. So, if there's no other questions, well, I will thank you, Mr. Kumar, and feel free to discuss. We can open some plenary discussion here now. So <laughs> thank you very much for participating. Thank you. Thank you. Or maybe uh, we can finish today and see you tomorrow. I think it's possible too. So if there's no questions or anything else, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, no, uh, Agata, this is the last session? Uh, for today, yes. And uh, we will continue uh, tomorrow at 11. Uh, I request uh, Professor Froze, you know, how this final restoration part should be start because in india professor masto is here he's a very good very very good number one soil scientist in india i think though, i i know this school somebody is working very good on funnel component yes sir. i think um, it's some light on funnel component i barely hear you sorry if somebody put some light or interaction on the funnel components in uh, in the context of Professor Masto's lecture, it will be great. To, it will be great uh, interaction. It will be good interaction. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, we can manage this. Uh, yeah. Regarding funnel, uh, um, there are few studies for agriculture soils for nematode. And the earthworm also, because I feel it's a very tedious work uh, to enumerate it and then um, getting into that. Sure, um, in this collaboration, we'll, be do, we'll do some work. Sir.
Hello, sir. Nice yeah. to see you after a long time. It's the Pitta, sir. Uh, how are you? Uh, so I am fine. So, so I have a question. Uh, like uh, our biochar is alkaline, so is the fly ash. So, what effect will it have on the pH of the soil when we apply both both the uh, amendment together? Okay. Yeah, both are alkaline, and uh, I don't think there should not be any problem because uh, even if we add a hundred or two hundred ton, this mining soil is a huge quantity. Hmm. Okay. Maybe for the initial years, there could be some decrease in plant growth if we are adding too much uh, quantity of that. Hmm. Otherwise, there should not be any problem. It Just, would be uh, effective in, a, uh, in an acidic mine spoil kind of a condition. In acidic mine, guess. yeah. If we use it for uh, acidic mine, that's good material. But for uh, alkaline mine spoil, like what we did for sponge iron based, uh, definitely we should not recommend there. Okay. Was, uh, if there are no proximities. Sponge iron mm -hmm. site, uh, it's alkaline. We should not recommend this. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hello. Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, Good evening. Myself, Dr. Singh. Yes, how are you, sir? Very fine, sir, very fine. Uh, it's a very good work you are doing. Your team is working excellent work on soil restoration. I have one query. Yes, sir. Because I found after 25 years of soil restoration program in the dry tropical region of India, I found a negative sign of restoration. How can I conclude and how can I cope up with the ecological restoration today? It's a big challenge. Uh, so negative sign, uh, you mean what is that even the plants are uh, dying? Soil, or, all soil parameters giving negative, negative parameters, negative indication. Okay, uh, we have to see. The, I mean maybe, carbon accretion, carbon accretion is not going in positive mode. Mm -hmm. Even soil microbial biomass is not going in positive mode. Soil nitrogen accretion is not going in positive mode. Yeah, uh, sir, really, soil, soil microbial biomass is, restoration is going takes place. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about soil microbial biomass, you see, we have to see with the sampling because it's such a sensitive parameter, uh, yeah. very rigorous sampling strategy has to be followed, first point. Then uh, you see the site, whether any, there is a superficial washing of the surface layers because in the surface layers, all the fine organic matter are there. Maybe we don't know, there was an episode of heavy rainfall, all the surface... No, 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 that's not, that, that is a good, well-established forest ecosystem, the newly okay. forest ecosystem on coal mine is I am starting work on 1992. Achha, achha. So, yeah, uh, if uh, microbial biomass carbon, then you have to look into that. Yeah, so yes, it's going to negative. Some species, okay. some species are positive, some species uh, given... Going down. Mm -hmm. Time. Yeah, so we have to see that. Uh, Maybe sampling strategy, uh, sampling is a very important part, sir. Yes, yeah, yes. It's a sensitive parameter. Uh, the grass sampling strategy should be there. So it means some species are not going well. Uh, maybe could uh, some allelochemicals, the leaf litters have some toxins, some allelopathic effects maybe, must be maybe. Maybe there. Maybe maybe, there. Yes. Because uh, right now, invisibility takes place invaded by two species, uh, Heptisovulence as well as Lentana camera. Mm -hmm. So maybe the reason and another point, maybe yes. uh, actually we are, we, are we, we want to uh, concern about ecological restoration. It means the soil fertility as well as the ecosystem fertility as well as the ecosystem services. So all those together, we want to achieve the sustainable because we yes. want to provide for the local people. Yes, so sir. They, mm -hmm. I am uh, achieving the goal. So even in the previous lecture, Professor Jan was mentioning about the negative <laughs> effect of uh, eucalyptus. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So we have to be very careful in selecting the plant species also. Maybe some plants grow very fast. So that, that's not the ecological restoration. You have to see our uh, ecosystem functions, um, particularly below yeah, ground sir, Actually, before before we did a very good uh, exhaustive uh, nursery trial experiment. Thirty nine species were tried. Mm -hmm. So thirty nine. 
Sir, you are located in. We will be happy to come to your place. You are located. Huh? How? Pardon? You you are um, in BHU or you are from sir? I'm no no no. I just shifted from BHU. Now I am working in Punjab University, Chandigarh. Is far okay. from BHU. Okay okay. Punjab University, Chandigarh. I worked there eleven years as a doctoral and doctoral. Then for job, I just joined here, Punjab University. Right sir. So we we'll see, sir. Um, okay, we'll have okay. more discussion, sir. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, I read your uh, all very good paper you published in Science of Total Environment as well as very prestigious journal. A lot of publications. Yeah, yeah. yeah Doctor Sangeeta is with me. With Mina, she did uh, hard work. Yeah, yeah. Also involved. Yeah, yeah. She is working in your group. Yeah, yeah. Same group. We are in the same place. Okay. So, sir, we will we will touch in future. Sure, sure, sir. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. So, Madam Agatha, if there is no more discussion, maybe we can. Yes, of course. If there is no question, yeah. yes, yeah. I think. Yeah, we'll uh, see tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. -bye. Thank Goodbye. You. Goodbye. So, see you tomorrow, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will stop recording for now and I will leave, I don't know, about 10 minutes to plenary discussion if somebody wants to say anything. Oh, <laughs> so thank you.